I call this hearing to order. Welcome to the virtual hearing of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. I will uh, start first by mentioning the agenda and making my opening statement to allow the others to, to give them time to log in. So this afternoon, we will be taking up the following matters. Arms Trade Treaty, that's number one. Number two is a Senate Resolution number 786, inquiring into the status of the Southeast Asia Collective Defense Treaty, or the so-called Manila Act, a Manila Pact. And then uh, last in our agenda, number three would be Senate Resolution number 787, urging the Executive Department to augment existing defense agreements with the United States of America. I will now make my opening uh, statement. Defense and security are matters that concern every state, whether domestically or globally. Strategies are in place for the protection and survival of every nation. Thus, alliances are made in order to protect sovereign rights and interests. The Philippines is a party to defense agreements such as the following. 1951 RPUS Mutual Defense Treaty, 1954 Southeast Asia Collective Defense Treaty, Philippine and United States Military Basis Agreement, which, wa which continuation was rejected and then terminated in 1991, Philippine-US Agreement regarding the treatment of United States Armed Forces visiting the Philippines, adopted by the Senate on May 27, 1999, the Philippines Australia Status of Visiting Forces Agreement, which was uh, adopted by the Senate on July 24, 2012. We also have the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement between the Philippines and the United States, which has been envisioned to advance the implementation of the 1951 Philippine US Mutual Defense Treaty. Uh, EDCA was signed on April 28, 2014. A new defense agreement to allow the transfer of defense equipment and technology from Japan to the Philippines, which was signed on February 29, 2016. It also provides for the Philippines and Japan to conduct joint research and development and even joint production of defense equipment and technology. And now we have the Arms Trade Treaty, which aims to reduce human suffering caused by illegal and irresponsible arms transfer, improve regional security and stability, as well as promote accountability and transparency by state parties concerning transfers of conventional arms. Arms are meant to secure and protect in the civilized world, but realities would show that these are used in countless crimes happening globally. In the United Nations, Office on Drugs and Crimes, UNODC, uh, in a 2020 study on firearms in 81 countries, it says that firearms trafficking is a global phenomenon with strong variations between countries. The UNODC study highlights the illicit circulation of firearms through firearms trafficking. It reports that a total of 550,000 firearms were seized during each of uh, 2016 and 2017. It is noted, however, that the real global figure for seizures is much higher than the 550,000 reported, as some of the countries covered by the study underreported their seizures for administrative reasons, and that many countries have not provided any information, including some of the world's most populous nations. In Asia, Shotguns were the most prominent type of arms that were seized, but many countries appear to have a lower capacity to intercept and report traffic firearms, which may lead to underreporting of some kinds of arms. Unregulated global arms trade, illicit arms that kill innocent civilians and destroy properties, regional threats, terrorism, and crimes that undermine peace, Conflicts arising from competing interests, infringements of rights, jurisdictional intrusions and encroachments, 
and violations of both national and international laws are all being addressed by national defense and security strategies. But some of the key questions before us now are, are these agreements effective and enough, especially those with the United States, like the EDCA, that includes provisions on humanitarian assistance and disaster response? Are these provisions being applied now in the midst of the pandemic and calamities and other emergencies? Do we need more agreements or enhancements in addition to what we already have? What is the current status of any defense agreement that we have entered into, especially the Southeast Asia Collective Defense Treaty? With, with the Philippines as the repository state of this particular agreement, has there been any activity that pursued any of its primary objectives? What is its current membership? In regard to the Arms Trade Treaty, how will this benefit our country? What challenges will the Philippines face once it is ratified? How is the Strategic Trade Management Office, STMO, preparing to implement this treaty together with the Philippine National Police or the Armed Forces of the Philippines? What mechanisms are already in place? What additional bureaucratic burden will it require from legitimate arms manufacturers, dealers in the industry? Will it make it harder for weapons to reach warlords, pirates, terrorists, and criminals, or to be used to commit grave human rights abuses or violations of international humanitarian law? So these are probably uh, questions which will be answered in the course of our discussion and hearing. So at this point, may I ask if uh, there is a fellow senator who has already joined us? Hello. Comsec. We have Senator Marcos, sir. I'm here, Sen I'm here uh, Chairman. And oh, senator and Sen so the, the chair acknowledges and welcomes Senator Win Gachalian and is Senator Marcos. Yes, I'm here. Hi. Hi, and Senator Amy Mike Marcos is, is also here. So thank you to the two of you for uh, providing me company <laughs> and uh, <laughs> establishing our forum, making our hearing uh, an official one. Okay. So at this point, at this point, uh, Comsec Sukandao will now recognize the resource persons who, who are with us this afternoon. Go ahead, ma'am. Thank you, Your Honor. From the Department of Foreign Affairs, we have Yusek Lourdes Iparagire from the Office of Multilateral Affairs and International Economic Relations, and also Assistant Secretary Roberto Manalo from the United Nations and International Organizations. We also have Your Honor Director Christine Margaret Malang from the UNEO. Mr. John Danilo Jao, and we have Attorney Crystal Gail Dampil and Attorney Sherlyn Viriana from the Office of Treaties and Legal Affairs. And also we have Ms. Joarlene Espirito from the Legislative Liaison Office of the DFA. We have from the Department of Justice for the Arms Trade Treaty, we have Attorney State Counsel Attorney Paulito De Jesus, and for the Manila Pact and Visiting Forces Agreement, we have Attorney Ulysses Aguila. From the Department of National Defense, they have only sent an observer. Uh, Comsec, you're muted for a while. Can you repeat? Okay, okay. I, yes, sir. From the Department oh, wait, wait, of wait, wait, excuse me. Uh, I acknowledge the presence of uh, Senator uh, Tolentino, who is with us. Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, apologies. I'm using another person's la laptop, so my name probably would be different. Your name is Office of Senator Tolentino, so that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> You're an office now, sir. You're an office. Thank you. Yes, I'm here. I'm here. And actually, yes. I'm here uh, in the office. Continue, continue, come sec. Thank you, sir. 
From the Department of National Defense, we have Director Norman Daanoy. From the Department of the Interior and Local Government, we have Undersecretary Bernardo Florese Jr. From the Office of the USEC for Peace and Order. And Assistant Secretary Marcelo Morales, which is the Assistant for International Relations and Other Interior Sector Concerns. From the National Security Council, we have Assistant Director General Maria Carmina Acuna. And as observers, we have Ms. Adaluisa Merhudio and Mr. Levy John Fabeliar. From the Office of the Special Envoy for Transnational Crimes, we have Ambassador Bruce Concepcion together with Lieutenant Colonel Dondon Austria, Attorney Hazel Hoves, and Mr. Jean Hesite. From the Presidential Commission on Visiting Forces, we have Undersecretary Pedro Cesar Rambuanga with Lieutenant General Jose Faustino Jr. I'm sorry, from the Armed Forces of the Philippines, we have Brigadier General Fernando Felipe. We have Brigadier General Jeffrey Hetchanova, Captain Nydia Carla Yoro, Captain Ms. Hanna Martinez from the Office of Legislative Affairs. From the Philippine Coast Guard, we have Commodore Allen Dalangin, Captain Ronald Pansipane, Captain Mitzi Silva Campo, Lieutenant Senior Grade Alan Enrico Alano, Lieutenant Junior Grade Maurice Reith Noronio, and Observer Lieutenant Senior Grade Lovely Rose Katayan. From the Philippine National Police, we have Police Brigadier General Romil Mitra, Police Brigadier General Warren F. De Leon, Police Colonel Fernando Ortega, Police Colonel Erwin Sanke, and Police Colonel Noel Ponolera as observer. And the other resource persons for the Arms Trade Treaty only are from the Department of Trade and Industry, we have Attorney Luis Manuel Catibayan from the Strategic Trade Management Office with Attorney Janice de Mayakyak also from the Strategic Management Office. From the Bureau of Customs, we have Captain Rodolfo Gonda Jr., Attorney Antonio Biado, and we also have Biliardo Anciro. From the private sector, Your Honors, we have Ms. Gina Marie Angco. She is the Deputy Chief Executive of the Arms for Global Defense Incorporated. We also have the President of the Association of Firearms and Ammunition Dealers of the Philippines. Mr. Hagen Alexander Topacio, with Mr. Conrad Tolentino, Mr. Patrick Dionisio, and Mr. Alaric Topacio. And of course, we have the regional representative of Nonviolence International Southeast Asia, Mr. Alfredo Lubang, and the programs manager of Nonviolence International Southeast Asia, Ms. Mitzi Ostero. And from we have certain observers, Your Honors. From the International Committee of the Red Cross, Ms. Attorney Jeffrey Michael Season, Ms. Kalishana Thine, and Attorney Georgia Hines of the ICRC. We also have from the Philippine Practical Shooting Association, we have as an observer attorney Raimundo Francisco, who's the general counsel of the association. That's all for now, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, Tomsek. Uh, so welcome to all of the uh, official uh, resource persons and we also welcome the observers and uh, we want to uh, we want everybody to know that you are all uh, free and welcome to submit to our community uh, your written uh, position papers inputs comments and uh, ideas so so please find a way to communicate with us and your inputs are all welcome I have already given my uh, opening statement, so I want to ask my fellow senators if they want to make some preliminary statements before we now tackle the arms trade treaty and the other two re re resolutions. Yes, Senator Amy Marcos is recognized. Thank you, Senator Ramon. Uh, 
Yes, thank you very much, uh, my chairman. Um, similar to your concerns about the ATT, are we going by order, Mr. Chair, uh, by ATT, or do we uh, give priority to Senator Tolentino's uh, resolutions? I will give priority to the ATT because this is a request now from the uh, executive for concurrence in the ratification. So this is oh, a okay. matter of uh, state interest, uh, ma'am. Yes. Well, That's great. Okay, so okay, we start with the okay. ATT talk. Um, similar to my chairman, I have concerns about uh, the uh, the hesitance of the local arms industry previously represented in uh, the 17th Congress that there would be an additional bureaucratic and documentary uh, burden imposed by the ATT. Is there a way that the DTI and PNP uh, can rationalize the international as well as domestic standards such that there isn't more paperwork? Uh, and also, like the chairman said, the separate strategic trade management office, does it need to be a new one? Or there are regulatory bodies under the PNP, the uh, Firearms and Explosives Office that we're very familiar with, or the DTI Strategic Trade uh, Management Office. Are they adequate or we have to set up a new one? Because uh, budget season's coming around and we'll have to deal with that. Um, on a uh, more uh, uh, personal note, uh, I have the foreign investments uh, bill pending in my committee of economic affairs and i would like to inquire what the opinion is of uh, all the resource persons as well as the chairman and the other senators here regarding the uh, provision there of uh, defense manufacture for export in the philippines it was uh, my recommendation that we delete the uh, part for export in as much as defense manufacture is so direly needed in the Philippines today. So uh, that was all, Mr. Chair. So thank you. Maybe our resource persons uh, still have time to go over the... Uh, There's a new billion, ma'am, no? That's a substitute bill for the Foreign Investments Act. Uh, please go over it so that we can... Uh, we can also discuss it as we discuss the ATT. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Yes, it's uh, Section 8. It makes mention of uh, okay. encouraging investments in defense manufacture, but only for export. Ang suggestion ko, tanggalin na natin yung for export para baka sakali makadali tayo ng investor dito sa atin. Thank you, ma'am. So, uh, uh, how about Senators Gachalian, Tolentino? Do you want to make some preliminary statement? Yes, Senator uh, Tol, Tolentino. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, if you will be following the order, my, my last two resolutions, do I still have to uh, make my opening statement? Statement of the resolutions or just for the AP? Just for. Uh, I think we're uh, having some trouble with the signal of Senator Tolentino. But Senator Tolentino, if you can hear me, maybe uh, maybe you can make the uh, a suggestion. Na lang po. Maybe you can make your preliminary statement regarding your resolution when we take them up. When we take them up. Okay, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is totally uh, a, a virtual he hearing. No, even our our staff are uh, virtually connected. Even the support staff, the technicians, are uh, work from home virtually. So uh, we will try our best. Senator Tolentino, hello. How's your connection? You're on mute, sir. Can mute, ka, sir. Uh, can you hear me now, sir? Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, sa, sa ATT muna, I, I would want the Department of Foreign Affairs, the defense establishment, to really clarify the urgent necessity of this. Given what transpired yesterday, the last day of the American presence in Kabul and the rest of Afghanistan, wherein 
we are now talking of prevention of illicit trade, while at the same time, when this treaty was prepared, the American presence was still in that region. We're not talking of 599,690 loose firearms. We're now being confronted with more than 2,500 Humvees on the loose in the hands of the Taliban. We're now being confronted with M4 rifles, uh, night vision goggles, and even aircraft, even drones in possession of terrorists, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman. So my, my question that has to be answered is how will this treaty prevent now the proliferation of these firearms, all, all, of the, all, of the, all of the items listed in the treaty except for naval, uh, except for warships, are included here. They're now in the hands of the terrorists. So how, how, can, how can this uh, diffuse the possible uh, illicit trade of, of firearms when Afghanistan was a signatory last July 20, 2020. And there is no more Afghanistan government now. And they have a, a treasure trove of uh, all the materials uh, incorporated in this treaty. So my, my question is, how, how, how will we, by mere affixing our signature here, ratifying this, contribute to the prevention, when even the Americans were not able to prevent uh, the capture of the firearms uh, by the Taliban. Uh, yun, po, yun po siguro, Mr. Chairman, ito po yung nakatakot ngayon. Hindi po nakasama sa treaty, hindi na pag-usapan. Even our mere uh, minuscule contribution of more than, more than 1,000 uh, uh, dollars is just the price of one M4 rifle, which is 1,278 dollars. So, uh, we, we have to approach this treaty given the current uh, evolving scenario in, in Kabul and the rest of Afghanistan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Wynn, uh, okay, if, if Senator Wynn will no longer deliver a preliminary statement, let us now go to item number one in our agenda, which is the Arms Trade Treaty. The executive branch is requesting for concurrence from the Senate. Uh, to the ratification of this treaty. So let's hear from the executive branch uh, to justify, uh, first of all, explain what are included in the treaty, uh, what are what are going to be our new obligations once we once we ratify or concur in the ratification, and what are the benefits. So maybe hear from the DFA. I think the logical agency to give the first presentation would be the Department of Foreign Affairs. Yes. In the DFA, ma'am, uh, uh, SCOPSEC, ma'am Lourdes, Paragire, yes, ma'am. Um, thank you, uh, Your Honor, uh, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, uh, Your Honor, uh, Mr. Chair, Your Honors, uh, um, members of uh, the Senate Committee on Foreign Affairs, uh, colleagues in government, uh, resource persons, uh, good afternoon. Um, Secretary Loxin has asked me to deliver his statement uh, for the hearing today and on his behalf, I am honored to speak about the Arms Trade Treaty. Uh, of course, uh, the DFA, uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs, particularly uh, the Philippine Mission in the United Nations in New York, was involved uh, in the negotiations of uh, the Arms Trade Treaty uh, with in the United Nations uh, in New York uh, with support from uh, the other agencies. Some of them were able to attend the negotiations uh, in New York, uh, which were held from start of 2010, actually, until uh, the agreement, uh, the treaty entered into force uh, in 2014. So uh, other agencies engaged uh, in the negotiations where uh, there were inputs from DND, but uh, in New York, uh, there was a representation also from uh, AFP, PNP, uh, the NISEA, uh, hmm, let me see, uh, Southeast Asia, this is an NGO, um, and uh, other uh, agencies of uh, government, DOJ. So uh, they, all these agencies composed the Philippine 
a delegation um, in uh, uh, the negotiations uh, of uh, the ATT in New York. Uh, but first, allow me to begin by citing studies, uh, statements of think tanks, international organizations, which significantly helped in enriching the discourse leading to the regulation of trade in conventional arms. According to a study conducted by the Center for Armed Violence uh, Reduction in partnership with the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and I quote, a small arms kill more people than all other weapon systems combined. Each year, as many as 500,000 people are killed in armed violence, 70,000 of them in conflict zones. The ready availability of lightweight illicit arms enables child soldiers, triggers refugee flows, enables the drug trade, threatens the state, and disrupts human security. About 800,000 new guns are added each year to the global stockpile of 875 million, close quote. In an International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC 1999 study, it was concluded that, wide, and I quote, widespread availability of arms facilitated violations of IHL or international humanitarian law and had damaging consequences for civilians during uh, armed conflicts. Former UN Secretary General Mr. Ban Ki-moon once said, and I quote, the world is overarmed and peace is underfunded. 60, 60 years of UN peacekeeping operations have cost less than six weeks of current military spending. Um, thus, from the so-called Nobel Laureates Initiative of Dr. Oscar Arias of Costa Rica, along with Desmond Tutu of South Africa and Jose Ramos Horta of uh, Timor-Leste, uh, to promote an international agreement regulating the trade in conventional arms, two conferences were held in New York in 2012 and 2013 with the aim of negotiating a legally binding instrument on the highest possible international standards for the transfer of conventional arms. On April 2, 2013, the final text of the Arms Trade Treaty was adopted by the UN General Assembly. In a nutshell, as uh, the chair has, uh, honorable chair has asked, the ATT is an international treaty that seeks to contribute to international and regional peace, security, and stability, reduce human suffering, and um, promote cooperation, transparency, and responsible action by member states, states parties uh, in the international trade in conventional arms. The ATT requires states to establish and maintain a national control system and designate national authorities and points of contact to oversee the implementation of uh, the treaty. The ATT and joint state parties uh, who are involved in the transfer of arms to ask questions uh, before authorizing the transfer, such as, number one, would the transfer violate obligations under measures adopted by the UN Security Council? Number two, uh, would the transfer violate relevant obligations under international agreements to which the state is a party? Number three, is there knowledge at the time of authorization for the exports of arms or items uh, would be used uh, will this be used in the commission of genocide uh, crimes against humanity or war crimes uh, so the states parties should be ready uh, to make uh, all these uh, assessments uh, of the risks uh, involved in the transfer of arms um, the att seeks to protect the legitimate political security economic i would say economic and commercial interests of states uh, to the international trade in conventional arms. The ATT promotes international cooperation and legitimate trade in material, equipment, and technology for peaceful purposes. The ATT pays particular attention to civilians, particularly women and children, who account for the vast majority of those adversely affected by armed conflicts and armed violence. The treaty was opened for signature 
on June 3, 2013 and entered into force on 24 December 2014. At this stage, the treaty has a total of 110 states parties and 31 states that have signed but not yet uh, ratified uh, the treaty. The Philippines signed the ATT on 25 September 2013. We were the first country to do so in Southeast Asia. Uh, there are other signatories of uh, the ATT from Southeast Asia, and that's Malaysia, Singapore, and uh, Thailand. No uh, uh, ASEAN um, uh, member state has uh, ratified the treaty to date. Uh, by signing this treaty, we signified our support for the efforts of the United Nations to address unregulated transfers of conventional arms and their illicit diversion to non-state actors. It reinforced our leadership role in the non-proliferation of arms and advocacy of international humanitarian law and international human rights law. It is about time, Your Honor, uh, Your Honors, uh, your, uh, Honorable Chair, that we follow through with our commitments by ratifying the ATT and depositing our instrument of ratification to the UN Secretary General. By becoming a state party to this treaty, we assure the international community as well as the Filipino people that the government is taking adequate measures to ensure control over arms within our territory and to prevent their diversion into the hands of those with intent on sowing the seeds of war and conflict. We increase our credibility and responsibility as both an arms importing and exporting country. We support a treaty that has at its core international peace, security and stability, and most importantly, the value of the human uh, person. Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Chair, and uh, your honors uh, for your kind attention. Tom, are you ready for questions? You sec. Uh, but some questions probably, uh, your honor, uh, Mr. Chair, would be better answered by the Office of the Special Envoy on transnational crimes because they're the ones actively involved now uh, in uh, coordinating interagency work um, in is, preparation is that, for is that Ambassador Bruce, Ambassador Bruce yes. Concepcion? Yes, Sorry. Ambassador Bruce Concepcion. I think okay. he will elaborate we on the provisions uh, of the treaty. Uh, thank okay. you, okay. Mr. Chair, uh, Your Honor. They also there, have a presentation, sir. Uh, Sigo, ganuna, if there is no objection from my uh, colleagues, after DFA, let's hear now from uh, Ambassador Bruce uh, Concepcion for his presentation, and then we can ask questions jointly. Ah, yes, Senator Amy. Yep. So, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to make a quick manifestation in uh, response to the concern of Senator Tolentino. I uh, feel that, uh, um, perhaps as he does, that uh, the ATT is no answer to the proliferation of illicit and loose firearms in the Philippines, given that so many of our illicit firearms are actually sourced in-country from backyard craftsmen. Some are looted from terror groups and insurgents, from uh, encounters, and some are sold underground by some unscrupulous individuals within the ranks themselves. So, parang walang bearing siya eh, sa ating proliferation of firearms. Uh, not to speak of also the largely failed uh, effort to register illegal firearms. So, all of these uh, uh, make me believe, as I suspect uh, Senator Tolentino does, na hindi makakatulong to sa problema natin ng uh, proliferation of illegal firearms. At sige, maybe, maybe... Uh, may respond, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, I, 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 I have a concern because of the, of the statement made by the President uh, during the Marawi siege that most of the firearms came from uh, overseas sources. And with what happened, in Afghanistan, with the uh, with the number of weaponry, the the, the tactical vehicles uh, practically turned over to the Taliban, there is a big chance that even 
a portion would reach other countries as well. That's why there is a there is a treaty. So my my question is, how how would how would this treaty enacted before that uh, before that Afghanistan fall uh, really diffuse uh, in the minds of the state parties that that uh, diffuse in the minds of the state parties that th there will be no. Uh, illicit sale which is which is one of the objectives of this uh, treaty and how can the state parties really tighten their borders etc etc because because all of these are uh, the main the main objective of the treaty is really to ensure the and eradicate the, uh, the illicit trade of uh, conventional firearms but given the number of firearms which is which are all american Mexican, uh, in that area, there is a big chance that it can fall into the hands of uh, parties which can sow terror, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. That, that, was, that was the reason. So the, the representative from the, the DFA failed to answer my question yeah. in the first place. Yes, Mr. Chair, if I uh, just uh, may uh, add. Um, I'm actually deriving this information from a previous hearing regarding the ATT of the Committee on Foreign Affairs. Uh, nung sinabi ng DND, pati na rin ng AFP, that the Marawi siege could not have been averted if the treaty was ratified earlier, precisely because the reasons for the proliferation of illicit and loose firearms had very little to do with uh, the uh, illegal importation of firearms. Yun lang po. Thank you. Okay, uh, in the course of the presentation, I hope the, <clears throat> the resource persons will try to address the concerns uh, raised. I could see two, huh? I could see two angles already, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Senator Aimee's angle is, uh, uh, it's really, uh, some are do, uh, supplied uh, internally, domestic domestically, and Senator Tolentino, uh, the collapse of a state, uh, I don't know if we can label uh, Afghanistan already as a collapse state, but you know, a collapse of a government which led to abandonment of uh, uh, many firearms and uh, Humvees and uh, know, equipment. Uh, that may also lead to to a uh, system of a network which and then they will find their way here in the Philippines. So I think uh, so. So let us recognize first the ambassador uh, of the Office of Special Envoy for Transnational Crime, Ambassador Bruce Tolentino. Tolentino. Ah, no, Bruce Concepcion. I'm sorry, Bruce Concepcion, to to uh, make his presentation. Sorry, Amba. Okay, go ahead. Honorable uh, Chairman, Senator Coco Pimentel, our Honorable Senators, uh, Amy Marcos, Honorable Senator Francis Tolentino, and Honorable Senator Wayne Gatchalian, our representatives and uh, distinguished delegates from other offices of the government and civil society organization. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for giving us this opportunity to present the key elements and provisions of the Arms Trade Treaty. The treaty was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly through UN Resolution 67, Class 234, on the 2nd of April 2013, and it was subsequently opened for signature on the 3rd of June of the same year. The Philippines signed the Arms Trade Treaty on the 25th of September 2013, and it was the first country in Southeast Asia to do so. Currently, the treaty has 110 states parties, 31 signatory states who are not yet states parties, and 54 states that have yet to join the ATT. The treaty aims to establish the highest possible common international standards for improving the regulation of the international trade in conventional arms and prevent and eradicate the illicit trade in conventional arms and their diversion. It seeks also to reduce human suffering caused by illegal and irresponsible arms transfers. It also seeks to contribute to international and regional peace and stability. 
to promote cooperation, transparency, and responsible action by state parties in the international trade of conventional arms, thereby building confidence among state parties. The treaty tackles Goal 16 of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which aims to promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective and accountable and inclusive institutions at all levels, specifically Goal 16.4, that advocates for the reduction of illicit financial and arms flows, strengthen the recovery and return of stolen assets, and combat all forms of organized crime. Illicit trafficking of firearms is being one of them. As enumerated in Article 2, Section 1 of the ATT, it covers all conventional arms within the following categories. Battle tanks, armored combat vehicles, large caliber artillery systems, combat aircraft, attack helicopters, warships, missiles and missile launchers, small arms and light weapons. Under Article 5 of the treaty, the core obligations of the states are to, number one, establish a national authority or authorities that control international transfers of conventional weapons. And number two, maintain a national list of items that are subject for transfer control. The Philippines passed the Strategic Trade Management Act, or SMA, in 2015, when the law specifically focuses on the local implementation of the UN Security Council 1540 resolution it likewise touches on important elements of the ATT, such as the two core obligations of, the, of under the treaty. The SMA created the Strategic Trade Management Office, now a functional office under the Department of Trade and Industry that serves as the executive and technical agency of the national government for the establishment of the management of systems for the trade in strategic goods and other related goods. The law also requires the establishment of the National Strategic Goods List in conformity with international commitments and non-proliferation obligations pursuant to bilateral and multilateral treaties, international conventions, and international non-proliferation regimes. This clearly shows that the Philippines is already compliant with the core obligations of the treaty, however. The following are the salient features of the Arms Trade Treaty. It prohibits certain arms transfers, as in Article 6, establishes criteria that needs to be fulfilled for authorizing weapons exports, as outlined in uh, Article 7, provides mechanisms for the prevention and combating of diversion, notably unauthorized re-exports and illicit trafficking of weapons, Article 11. With the question of how it, it can help in the illicit trafficking, domestic illicit trafficking of weapons in the Philippines, uh, this area is uh, of concern because uh, it it is uh, about unauthorized re-exports, unauthorized re-exports and uh, uh, transshipment, which uh, is happening occasionally in the, in the country. Although it's a domestic issue, it somehow goes transnational at certain points. It obligates state parties to report to their measures to implement the ATT as well as to submit annual reports on weapon and imports and exports or authorizations for such imports or exports as in uh, what is outlined in uh, Article 13. At the heart of the ATT are Articles 6 and 7, which concerns uh, about the transfer of conventional arms, their ammunition, parts and components, to strict criteria with the aim of ensuring that the weapons do not end up in the hands of the wrong hands of those who would use them to commit serious violations of international human law, humanitarian law, and international human rights law, and other serious crimes. To clarify the arms transfers prohibited under the treaty, may I enumerate the provisions set forth in Article 6. Article 6 specifies that arms transfer satisfying any of the conditions must be prohibited. Number one, if a transfer would violate an arms embargo adopted by the UN Security Council acting under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. Number two, if it would violate international obligations under international agreements 
to which the state is a party. And number three, if it has knowledge and the time of authorization that the items would be used in the commission of genocide, crimes against humanity, or certain war crimes. However, if the proposed transfer has not been prohibited by the general provisions of Article 6, an exporting state party must assess the potential that the arms or items would contribute to or undermine peace and security. If it is determined that the arms transfer would contribute to or undermine peace and security, then the export should not be authorized. On the other hand, if the transfer is determined to be to contribute to peace and security, there must be a further assessment of the extent to which they could be potentially used to commit or facilitate serious violations of international humanitarian law or international human rights law and to commit or facilitate an offense of terrorism or transnational organized crime designed under treaties to which the exporting state is a party. Let us be mindful that these uh, violations uh, of transnational organized crimes may not have implications to the to international humanitarian law, but are concerns which are growing concerns in the modern world. Uh, article seven and uh, section four and article eleven, section two also emphasizes that importing states needs to also take into account the risk of the transfer being used to commit or facilitate serious acts of gender-based violence or serious acts of violence against women and children and risk of diversion of the items. Let me enumerate some of the benefits of acceding to the treaty. By ratifying the treaty, states reinforces international and humanitarian security and demonstrate its commitment to upholding international humanitarian law and international human rights law. And then the global arms trade also affects all people of the world. ATT, which enables a comprehensive regulation of the arms trade, contributes to international and regional peace, security, and stability. Improved arms regulation also reduces the risk of weapons and ammunition reaching the hands of criminal gangs and armed groups. Most of them are growing, going transnational. And this translates into an improved, improved domestic security situation, less opportunity for armed violence and more safety for civilians. And finally, the ATT encourages cooperation and assistance among states parties, as well as extending assistance to those parties that need them. The Philippines have been also a beneficiary of those assistance, even if we are we were just a signatory in, in those times up to now. Thus, the states parties can make use of provisions for international cooperation set forth in treaty for the purpose of number one, strengthening national laws and systems for the regulation and control of conventional arms and ammunition. Second, strengthening national capacity to prevent diversion of arms. Third, carrying out investigations, prosecutions, and judicial proceedings. Fourth, preventing and combating corruption. And lastly, gathering intelligence and accessing information and lessons learned obtained by other states. The ATT requires its state parties to submit to the Secretariat information aimed at enhancing transparency as well as ensuring that state parties are taking the measures necessary for the implementation of the treaty. This is a significant contribution to international and regional peace and security. In preventing all modes of consequences brought about by conflict and widespread armed violence, countries face, facing armed conflict, such as the Philippines, or high levels of armed violence, have to invest significant resources in defense and security annually to the detriment of social and economic development endeavors. And for 50 plus years or so, which the Philippines have been suffering of armed conflict with the armed terrorists demonstrates such. Ratifying the treaty builds credibility, repute, 
especially in the arms industry. One criteria of consideration by an importing country when conducting assessment is the country profile of the country of destination or the importing country and the export control regime that they are a member of or a related treaty or convention that they are a party to is being examined in these uh, export and import regimes. Honorable Chairman, thank you for this opportunity and we hope to be part of the ATT soon as a nation against uh, armed violence. Thank you so much. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Ambassador. Yes, Santa Marcos. Yes, sorry, Mr. Chair. With the repeated emphasis of Ambassador Concepcion on Article 6 on the unequivocal prohibitions to export firearms, um, are we not merely inviting a potential embargo and blacklisting of the Philippines if we become a state party with allegations of human rights violations, extrajudicial killings, the drug war, the exporting party may easily be prohibited from shipping vitally needed weaponry to our government. On the suspicion that the country is involved in crimes against humanity, member states will not approve exports of conventional weapons, even if it is legitimately for the use of our government. For example, and uh, Mr. Chair, maybe we can ask the PNP to confirm this report, the PNP had to cancel awarded contracts for Sig Sauer rifles, for Glocks, Glock pistols, rifle magazines, because the USA refused to issue the export permits. We know that the new democratic uh, regime um, has uh, been very vocal uh, against human rights uh, violations. Some European nations have also expressed the disapproval of exports, particularly of arms and armaments to the Philippines. May I hear from uh, the good ambassador, as well as the PNP regarding these reports, as well as the AFP and the DND, who are probably familiar with similar uh, problems. Thank you so much, uh, Madam uh, Senator, Honorable Senator, for uh, asking that question. Um, Actually, uh, we are a member of the UN and uh, we are not excused from sanctions. Whether we are a member of the ATT or not, we, have, we are subject of, and on a day-to-day -day basis, we are subject of sanctions. If we export and uh, those exports of firearms go to, let's say, for example, a country... It's the other way around, Mr. Ambassador. It's the importations that we so direly need for our AFP and uh, PNP. We are not uh, uh, by any means a large export uh, contractor. In uh, the reverse, uh, we need so much help from outside. Yes, ma'am. This, this work, it works uh, both ways, uh, import and export. So if uh, an import does not land in the hands of uh, like an importing agency such as the PNP and goes the wrong way to wrong hands, uh, uh, then uh, this is something that uh, must alarm us. And uh, the ATT provides a solution of monitoring a, a, a system of transparency. Mr. Ambassador, that's not the question. The question is the uh, countries that support the Philippines um, armaments effort will be uh, stopped from sending us any help as they have reportedly already been uh, because and this ATT like you said we're under the UNCHR we're under the UN and uh, the entire uh, regime that that imposes but uh, signing the ATT will only strengthen this potential for embargo and blacklisting mas lalo hindi tayo makakatanggap ng maski ano um, uh, it is uh, nice to believe that way, ma'am, but uh, what happens if uh, is that uh, with a good reputation, uh, the, the imposition of uh, embargoes and sanctions will be further because we have a better reputation than before. So just like uh, any product with a good brand, you are assured that... Uh, anything that is related to this product with a good brand will be regular and uh, 
we will be as a government avoiding uh, those uh, um, or preventing by establishing national control systems uh, in preventing diversion and uh, illicit trafficking of these uh, arms and weapons. Uh, Senator Amy, we, maybe we can ask uh, PNP. PNP. Yes. AFP, AFP. Yung specific. We can talk about AFP and PNP. Can we ask you for specific uh, conventional arms uh, agreements which were not uh, carried to fruition, carried to the end by the uh, other party, the vendor? Uh, citing what but uh we know we, we want to know what citing what and then maybe maybe another treaty was uh, also invoked or a uh, general uh, un membership so but okay. can you give us specific examples uh, pnp uh, pnp who's, mr who's chair there? uh who's, the at, oh, please identify yourself, Senator. Mr. Chair, uh, I have the privilege to speak Attorney Norman Dano, Chief of the Legal and the Legislative Affairs of the Department of National Defense. Okay, so DND, uh, DND, Attorney Norman Dano, you have DND. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and distinguished members of the Sudabal Committee. Mr. Chair, the Arms Trade Treaty is not a disarmament treaty. The ATT still recognizes legitimate procurement of. Uh, uh, governments for purposes of its security forces. This is not a prohibition of procurement, Mr. Chair. As I have said, this is not a disarmament treaty. Yet, the Attorney treaty Dan, provides... Are you saying it's disarmament? We want armaments. That's the problem. This is not a disarmament uh, uh, treaty, Mr. Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Chair. The, the, the treaty recognizes still uh, governments can still procure for the legitimate use of their security forces. Of course, if there are issues, that will be assessed. We have experienced that, uh, Mr. Chair. We have a procurement, I think, in the uh, in, uh, in United Kingdom, in Europe. Uh, uh, our human rights uh, records were questioned, and uh, the procurement was uh, uh, stopped, uh, suspended uh, in the meantime. But after assessment, after assessment and justification, the department of uh, the, the trade the department of trade of uh, i think germany somewhere in germany issued a clearance for the uh, for the um, delivery of the items in the philippines so it's a matter uh, mr chair of uh, presenting it justifying it that is a legitimate uh, legitimate procurement so uh, we have we have experienced that my mr chair yes, was Dano, in are you saying Thank you, mr. that chair. Uh, are you saying attorney danoy that uh the uh, signing or non-signing of the ATT made no difference? Well, uh, we have a different perspective, uh, uh, perspective, perspective uh, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Chair, if we have to ratify the uh, Arms Trade Treaty, unless uh, you give me a five minutes uh, a statement in behalf of the Department of National Defense, then I will uh, state for it, uh, Mr. Chair. No, I'm just okay. asking. Seven, in, the, uh, in the sorry, sorry, Mr. Chair, I was just uh, okay. Question, just more, question from me. Senator Marcos. Yes, and then answer lang Attorney Danoy. Answer the question. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry. Um, in the purchase that you alluded to uh, of firearms and ammo from Germany, uh, when uh, the uh, export was stopped, you said after you made a case for it it was reconsidered and the uh, sale pushed through what i am asking is at that point in time as we are today we were not signatories to the att the att did not make any difference the fact that we were not signatories so therefore if we become signatories it will not help us in any way is that what you are saying i think during the time uh... We are already signatory to the treaty, Madam, uh, Mr. Chair. We are signatory to the treaty. And uh, the imposition or the prohibition uh, during that time is only on the basis, I think it's not based on ATT. I think it is, uh, it is a national uh, uh, 
determination on the part of uh, Germany during that time because of issue of human rights, etc. And uh, and maybe even if we look at the ATT, maybe the vendor is a party to the ATT, hence uh, they also have uh, obligations. And then I'm sure the countries mentioned by Attorney Danoy at that time, UK, Germany were a member of the uh, EU siguro, at that time. They, all, they also have their own treaty. They also have their own treaty uh, with, with standards and that's what they're following. Siguro ganun na nangyari. Uh, uh, sige, uh, sige uh, Ambassador Concepcion, you have something to contribute? Yes, sir. Just a bri brief one, sir, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, this is really the problem if we we are not a member or we remain a signatory or not a state party and then we continue purchasing uh, arms and equipment from other countries because especially if the country of origin is a state party of course they will be declaring their arms sales to to us and to other countries and we will turn out to be lying in the international community because we, we are not we are not declaring or not being transparent uh, as other states uh, should be. Ambassador, now, Ambassador, yes, there are those with the opposite opinion saying that uh, sales will be quicker um, if you're a non-member because it doesn't risk an embargo or a blacklisting. The uh, sales can continue to be recorded and reported by the exporting country, but uh, at the same time, it does not expose the Philippine government to uh, blacklisting because of alleged human rights violations. May opinion no. po na ganun eh, na hayaan na na wag member, tapos tuloy-tuloy ang benta, at least hindi na baban. Uh, it's on the, op the, the reality is uh, on the opposite, ma'am, because um, if I may, ma'am, by the way, uh, what happens is uh, non-member states will be treated as uh, especially if there's an armed conflict existing in the country, will be uh, a point against you being a, a member of the international community. You'll be seen as a rogue state, as a uh, state that cannot control itself, uh, as, as cannot govern by itself. So... Uh, I think it's, that's an exaggeration, Ambassador. Ang dami pang hindi nagpipirma. Um... Uh, most of those are um, really not. If we 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 have to look at ourselves, not not on those uh, levels of uh, uh, <laughs> reputation, ma'am. We should we, okay. we, we should not compare ourselves to those uh, small states, which uh, uh, Afghanistan, for example. Uh, we should we should we should be more forward looking. Uh, we are Filipinos. Uh, and, the Philippines must be treated as with a better outlook than than just uh, a lowly state, uh, 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 a laggard. Uh, we, we have to depart from those thinking. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, but but uh, uh, the understanding of the chair is this. If the vendor is a state party, even though the buyer is not a state party, still, diba? the vendor has the burden uh, to comply with the ATT. Tama po ba yun? And the basic understanding ko, Ambassador Bruce. So, tama, ganun yun. So, so it does not prohibit a uh, uh, state party transacting with a non-state party. Basta kung state party ka na, ano, ano ba yung principles sa international law? In good faith, you comply with your treaty obligations. Ganun po yun. Ganun po yun. Ah, sige, ganito. Mr. Si Attorney uh, Danoy re re requested for time to make the presentation for DND na po ba yan, Attorney Danoy? That's, that's the DND's presentation? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, pa Pauna na po kita. Sige po, uh, can, you can make your presentation, sir. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is the position of the Department of National Defense. Uh, we have observed, Mr. Chair, of the towns and manifested in various efforts through national regional and international workshops and seminars conducted and or participated in the Philippines regarding the ratification of the treaty. To fulfill the country's international commitments and obligations under the Arms Trade Treaty 
ang the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1540 or Non-Proliferation of Weapons of Mass Destruction. Republic Act Number 10697, otherwise known as the Strategic Trade Management Act, was passed into law on November 13, 2015. What is the purpose of this law? STMA aims to stop, to stop the spread of weapons of mass destruction and regulate conventional arms transfer through responsible management of strategic goods and the provisions of related services in trade and investment. Mr. Chair, ito treaty lang kasi ito eh. Hindi ito maging effective, Mr. Chair, until such time we have a national legislation to be issued. And this is the first. We have the STMA. The Philippines has also initiated discussions on building an integrated sensitive strategic and goods database, database system that would cover not only conventional arms, but all regulated goods, including non-military items. In the context of the recent progress in global technology capacity, the Department of National Defense is of the view that having a database system is now a priority to improve information sharing and real-time ex exchange of data and concerns among government agencies. The Department of National Defense also adheres that there is a need for the international community, including non-governmental organizations, to pull resources and use the appropriate technology to universalize the tracing, very important, tracing, reporting, and accounting of the world's firearms. This would facilitate the tracking and tracing of firearms and help prevent them ending up in the wrong hands. Moreover, the Department of National, Be the, the Department of National Defense believes that the Arms Trade Treaty, which applies to all conventional arms, ammunitions, munitions, or parts and components thereof, will address and help prevent illicit in small arms and light weapons by focusing on international cooperation and measures to tackle diversion, particularly in stockpile security and management. Through the Arms Trade Treaty, the state parties and signatories have the obligation to review applications for exports of conventional arms and conduct national export assessment on the risk that the exported arms could have on peace, security, human rights, etc. Mr. Chair, the proliferation of small arms weapon has been identified as a peripheral security concern, I repeat, as a peripheral security concern of the Department of National Defense in the Defense Planning Guidance 2022 to 2027. As the said, proliferation has contributed to armed conflicts and rebellions, not only in the Philippines, but in the Southeast Asia region as well. The illicit trafficking of such weapons has immensely contributed to instability in the regions where rebels and lawless elements have amassed weapons that could potentially use against civilians and non-combatants. Furthermore, Mr. Chair, the ratification of the Arms Trade Treaty will provide transparency in an international arms trade through its reporting obligations. Therefore, the provisions in the treaty can pave the way to more overall reliability in legal arms transfer and reduce human rights, human suffering caused by illegal and irresponsible arms transfer, improve regional security and stability, as well as promote accountability and transparency by state parties concerning transfer of conventional arms. The Department of National Defense supports the work concerned by concerned Philippine government agencies, particularly the Office of the Special Envoy on Transnational Crime in coordination with the Department of Foreign Affairs to bring the country closer to ratifying the ATT as a commitment to uphold international peace, security, and the rule of law. Lastly, Mr. Chair, as, as, you, as you have noted in Section 26, Section 26 of the, uh, of the Arms Trade Treaty, it is a contribution of the Department of National Defense through with the Department of Foreign Affairs that the treaty, that the treaty shall not prejudice obligations the state parties under existing or future agreements. And the treaty shall not be the grounds for voiding defense contract, defense cooperation agreements 
concluded by state parties. Marami kasi tayo, Mr. Chair, ng mga defense cooperation agreements. Eh. Uh, yung first crafting nito during the... It, uh, during the first crafting nito sa United Nations, napuna na namin ito that uh, it would affect our existing uh, defense cooperation agreements. That's why, as uh, you note in Section 26, hindi na sa ngayon. The treaty will not, shall not prejudice obligation under SIPA. Kasi marami tayo mga defense cooperation agreements with other countries that we are procuring. Kasi mapiktuan, Mr. Chair, yung modernization program natin, if we will, if this provisions under Section 26, hindi ko na-revise ng gusto. Kasi kontra ito. So, now, that's why we support this. Basta kung hindi mapiktuan yung mga defense cooperation agreements natin, Mr. Chair, we support this Arms Trade Treaty. As a matter of fact, Mr. Chair, the Department of National Defense has always submitted its certificate of concurrence for this treaty to the Department of Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Attorney Dan. Noy. Uh, you mean to say Article 26 of the treaty was uh, Philippine contribution in the drafting? Ganun po ba yan? Is that what you're trying to tell us? Yes, Mr. Chair. As a matter of fact, I'm one of those who attended in the International Law, Law Commission of the United Nations. Pinasok namin ito because ito, okay. sir, ito rin sir ang mga reklamo ng mga ibang countries, Mr. Chair. Kaya okay. pasok ito siya. Uh, thank you, thank you. Congratulations for that. Tinignan ko Article 26. Uh, Yusek uh, Lourdes, yes ma'am? Yes. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, perhaps to answer some of the questions uh, raised uh, earlier, I would like to cite uh, some implications of becoming a state party uh, to the ATT. First, uh, as a responsible member of uh, uh, the United Nations, we will be, by becoming a state party to the ATT, uh, we will be contributing to this global effort of uh, addressing unregulated transfers of conventional arms and uh, contribute to uh, global and regional peace and security. That's one. Um, uh, second, um, in terms of uh, the issue uh, regarding flow of uh, illicit flows of arms from countries in conflict, for example, Afghanistan, then perhaps one of the benefits of this uh, treaty is uh, international cooperation to enhance capacities and access to information, real and up-to-date uh, information. So I think uh, that's uh, very important to us uh, to have this information on tracking and tracing uh, illicit uh, flow of uh, arms. Um, Third, um, in terms of uh, what the ATT is not, uh, there have been misconceptions that ATT is like this and it's like that, it prevents this and prevents that. Um, uh, it has been explained by the UN uh, Office on Disarmament Commission, I think, a UN ODA agency, that uh, as a the representative, uh, distinguished representative from the DA has mentioned, uh, DND has mentioned that it is not a disarmament treaty, nor it is is it a treaty for the reduction of arsenals. Uh, so it's uh, it reaffirms the sovereignty of the state to purchase arms uh, for its defense uh, and security. It does not. The ATT does not prohibit. Uh, international trade in arms. It does not regulate in any way internal transactions, in particular the acquisition of arms by civilians, uh, because uh, one member, uh, UN, the US, for example, said it might uh, affect the right to bear arms. So it said that it, it does not affect the sovereign right of states um to regulate and control <coughs> conventional arms within its territory pursuant to its own legal or constitutional um constitutional systems now with regard to um possible economic uh, implications uh, by becoming a state party uh, to the ATT. As mentioned earlier, um, it does not prohibit uh, international trade 
uh, in arms. Um, it reaffirms uh, the sovereignty of state uh, to produce arms, uh, to purchase arms uh, for its uh, defense uh, and security. And we, what it does actually, ATT, is that um, by regulating illicit uh, arms transfers, illicit flows of weapons, it uh, provides, um, it fosters <coughs> peace and security uh, in the country. Um, because for investors or foreign investors, their biggest enemy is uncertainty. So if there are threats to security, uh, then of course uh, it does not encourage investors uh, to come to that particular country and to invest uh, in that uh, country. With, in terms of blacklisting and uh, embargoes of flow of arms, uh, this is governed by another um, UN, uh, how do I say it, uh, uh, agreement. Uh, arrangement and that is under the UNSC, UN Security Council uh, 1540, um, which um, prevents non-state act actors from acquiring WMDs, nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons, their means of delivery and other materials, and prevent illicit uh, transfer of arms uh, to address the risk of uh, that terrorists might obtain, proliferate, or use weapons of mass destruction. Now, under UNSC um, 1540, there is a committee on sanctions, and this committee prepares the blacklisting of uh, certain countries from receiving uh, certain uh, weapons as well as uh, conventional arms. Um, I hope I was able to enlighten um, and address some of the questions raised earlier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your contribution. Senator Aimee, how are you? I just like uh, to chide the DFA for their blanket characterization by Ambassador Concepcion <laughs> of all non signatory states to the ATT as rogue states. I think. Uh, um, as uh, you will see in the updated listing of signatories only among the UN, uh, Russia, the second largest uh, provider of arms throughout the world, uh, upwards of 20%, and one uh, who has been a suki of the Philippines, refused to sign. The largest democracy in the world, hardly a rogue state, uh, India refused to sign. Even here in Asia, in ASEAN, our neighbors, Vietnam and Indonesia, because of similar concerns as those I have raised regarding alleged human rights violations, refused to sign. And the list goes on with Pakistan, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, and many stalwart uh, allies of the Philippines and the Western world. Thank you. I just wanted to put that on record, Paul. Yeah. Yes, and then how, how about those who signed but did not ratify? Parehas din yun. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chair, can I can I put in yeah. something, Mr. Chair? Uh, uh, sige, and then I will recognize Senator Gatchalian. Sige, Attorney Dano, uh, ay kayo muna, yes, sir. Sinabi ni Senator uh, Marcos itong India, hindi sila nagperma. When they were asked during that, um, uh, during the meeting at the United Nations, they did not give any, kwan eh, did not give any reason why they refused or they opposed the Arms Trade Treaty. Kinatanong sila eh, bakit, why, why? Uh, there are so many countries questioning them. Ang punto lang nila is that um, you oppose it. Yun lang, sir. Uh, yun lang ang mama may bigay ko, sir, ngakuan, nga information. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes. Thank you for that historical uh, tidbit. Uh, uh, Senator Gatchalian, yes. yes. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I'd like to continue what uh, Senator Aimee opened up earlier no? because uh, this is a simple question from an ordinary civilian. Um, Hindi natin pwedeng pagkaila that uh, we have this ongoing uh, internal conflict uh, with various groups. And my the all there's only one question in my mind all the time. Eh? How come there are arms flowing to these groups? And uh, in fact, ever since, no, since I was in high school, college, and then now, my question still remains. How come there are arms flowing to these groups? 
and their arms at, at many points are even at, at least the ones I see on media no at many many instances are better than ours are higher caliber than ours uh, they look like they're brand new or they're uh, uh, more modern so um, but my basic question is how come there are arms flowing to our to our country without being detected by government and then my second question is how can this treaty uh, once and for all stop those arms flowing uh, i have a i have some answers in my mind i know center i mean i'm sure we all have our own uh, hunch but i just want to get uh, the the uh, uh, the statement of our friends from the DND and, and also the PNP on how come we cannot curb this illegal trade and arms flow to our country. That's why this is one reason why we have almost unending uh, conflict with different groups. Uh, we're not even talking about organized crimes. Huh? Organized crimes is another story, but at least for the you know, for the uh, this this uh, groups that we are in conflict with. So those are my two questions. You no, know? how come we cannot curb it, and how can this treaty curb it? Again, anybody who wants to answer the questions of uh, Senator Gatchalian, especially you know how what is the contribution of ATT in this uh, in the improvement of the situation here in the Philippines, where there are too many loose firearms. Or sources of uh, illegal firearms. Ano, P PNP kaya? PNP? Who's representing PNP? Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Uh, Brig Police Brigadier General Romil Mitra, sir, the Chief of the Firearms Explosive Office. Yes, General Mitra, go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. As you can see, sir, in, the uh, in uh, Mindanao, sir, those uh, groups are uh, brandishing their firearms, sir. As you can see, this. These firearms are not uh, commercially commercially available, sir. The AKs and the uh, what do you call that? The anti uh, tank uh, brandishing these firearms. These are not uh, commercially available, sir. So maybe these firearms are uh, smuggled in through our border, sir. That's our uh, assessment, sir, with regards to the firearms now in the hands of these terrorists, sir. Uh, in the Marawi siege, we have more than a thousand firearms confiscated and confiscated, and these are now in the process of identifying uh, 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 some bagaling to firearms, nito, sir. And uh, uh, with that, sir, uh, maybe we can now uh, identify kung saan ang galing tong firearms, sir. Once we have uh, 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 invented these uh, confiscated firearms, sir. That's the time that we can answer the question, sir, kung saan uh, ang source ng firearm, sir. Sherwin, Senator Sherwin. Uh, on the point of how will this treaty prevent, uh, obviously, nang galing yun so, from illegal, uh, illegal trade and illegal channels. Uh, they're not uh, part of our system. So, paano po... Uh, by hinto nitong treaty na ito no? because this treaty I, I, I was listening intently earlier uh mr chair and uh, of course no the, the, the concepts are beautiful no uh, uh peace and order uh, just, uh what are the other ones that i wrote here peace and order and uh, more investors because of the preserved uh, perceived peace but uh but in reality hindi naman po mahinto yung pagpasok nitong illegal na mga firearms. So, uh, there's a disconnect between the beautiful objective and also reality. So, how can this treaty address reality? Siguro si Ambassador Concepcion, who is most familiar with the terms of the treaty, can tell us, uh, if, if applicable already, uh, how can we improve our situation, sir? Uh, thank you so much, uh... Mr. Chairman, sir, Honorable Chair, um, with respect to domestic uh, uh, illicit trafficking uh, within the borders uh, of our country, um, the ATT cannot do anything because uh, 
hands off siya dyan kasi uh, dito lang tayo sa, sa labas, parang ganun. Uh, they respect the sovereignty of the country, the Philippines for one, uh, at hindi nila pinapakailaman yan. Uh, although, it will help kung sila makialam dyan, but the treaty says no, Hang, hanggang sa labas lang tayo. International trade lang tayo. So, at that's what uh, our friend from the defense uh, um is uh, have uh, uh, illustrated uh, earlier. Now, for external trade, uh, for example, itong mga baril na naiwan ng mga Americans sa Afghanistan. Now, with ATT, this can be monitored already because uh, once it goes out of Afghanistan, baka bitbitin nila hanggang you know where, uh, Mindanao or, or so, uh, with ATT, mamonitor natin kasi uh, end-to-end ang mangyari. Nasa napunta yung shipment na yun? Ano yung sinakaya na yun? Uh, so, with with ATT monitoring these vessels and uh, all international uh, instrumentalities, uh, accounting, all these firearms, we can prevent... Uh, I, I cannot say for sure that 100% will prevent kasi we have a very long coastline. The Philippines, ito ring isang challenge na yan. At hindi yun masagot ng AT, ATT kasi kahaba-haba ng coastline natin. Kahirap natin uh, i-secure yun. The Navy and the Coast Guard knows that. Talagang mahirap. But ATT can help. This is not a 100% solution to all our problems, uh, especially the arms uh, proliferation in the country. But uh, ito y- uh, modern uh, instrument na makatulong sa ating uh, arms con- uh, arms proliferation in the country. Uh, hindi, hindi ito the right to bear arms is not a privilege, it's a right in the US. But in the Philippines, no. It is not. It is just a privilege. It is just a privilege. Now, it's an internal um, issue and and uh, supposed to be addressed by our concerned government agencies. Hindi pero pakialaman ng, ng ating one yan, ng ating ATT, ATT uh, being a, of being a state party to ATT. Um, so, yun, Mr. Chair, uh, Thank you. partly Thank we, you can, we, can, we can help uh, with the problem, but not 100% because the rest of it is uh, internal. Uh, marami tayong gumagawa mag, magagaling ang Pinoy, gumagawa ng sariling baril so wala talagang magawa ang ATT dyan uh, One of the many steps to address this problem one of the many but not the only parang, parang, parang ganon uh, okay. Yes, Senator Tolentino uh, are we up? Uh, teka ba na, teka na Senator Tolentino Senator, Tor- Senator, yeah. Senator Win? Yes, uh, Chair, just to close lang, no? well uh, I can see some national benefit in this discussion of uh, the ATT. However, the root cause is not, um, as far as I'm concerned, no, it's not uh, directly addressed. No? Um, like, for example, the uh, basic lang is the, yeah, the gun running, the illicit trade, and um, that, that's what I'm um, driving at. No? Although I can see some national benefit, um, hopefully we can extend this or, or improve this somehow to address the root cause that is creating uh, havoc no, in our uh, peace and order and also national security. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Thank you, Senator Gatchalian. Senator Tolentino. Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, I'd like to thank Senator Gatchalian for opening up that issue uh, and Ambassador Concepcion for being partially forthright and honest uh, in mentioning uh, our inability Senator Tolentino, uh, your signal is uh, intermittent on and off. Mm. 
Senator Tolentino, you, you care to repeat what you said, but please unmute, sir. Please unmute, yes. Uh, Coms Comsec, can we just call Senator Tolentino yes, that we will give him time later when, when the connection. Siguro ganito, uh, I want to pursue the yung kay Senator Marcos na point kanina. Can PNP, uh, AFP give us ano, specific contracts regarding conventional firearms which were not uh, carried out by the supplier citing something and if you know the treaty used or the ground Ah, is okay. So, PNP and uh, AFP, can you just, ano, uh, just prepare your uh, input? Senator Tolentino is back online, sir. Senator Tolentino, you once again recognize. Ay, nawala na naman. Sir, excuse me, sir. Maybe we can uh -huh. advise Senator Tolentino to the, to just turn off his video and just use sir, his audio. Oh. Yes, please, please call him or his staff. Oh, sige, can we? Who can share? Ilang yung. Yung specific lang. Kung wala, wala. Kung meron, wala. pakikwento sa amin. Kung meron. Please. Sino? PNP or uh, AFP? Sir, Mr. Fred Lubang, I think, would like to respond also from the Nonviolence International. I'm, I'm, I'm asking for contracts muna yung kay tanong ni Sato kanina. Ano, Sig Sauer, Glock, gano'n. Totoo ba yun? Nangyari ba? Nangyari ba? O na-delay lang? Kasi ang kwento ni, uh, uh, kay Atty. Danoy, uh, na-delay lang. Eh. So, uh, iba, ano, kung, kung wala, wala. Kapag dati pipilitin na meron. But is there PNP, AFP? Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, General, uh, General, General Mit uh, Mitra. Data, sir. Kung meron, sir, I, I will uh, submit it to the Secretary Chair. Ah, okay. Thank yes. you, AFP. Yung mga, yung mga, yung ba yung Center IME, were you referring to mga helicopter deals, mga ganyan ba also? And then, iba yun, iba pa uh, yun. Sabi ko yung uh, awarded contract, tayo ang bibili, ah. hindi siya oh, aid. Ayaw bibili. Uh, kontrata talaga yun, we purchased six hour rifles, Glock pistols, and rifle magazines. What happened? They said that the U.S. refused to issue the export permit. Yun ang report noon. So perhaps you can enlighten okay. us on that. Yung sa helicopter na sinasabi ni Chairman, ang pagkaalam ko, ang nangyari doon, may limit on the use. Although we were going to pay for Canadian helicopters, we were advised that they could only be used for humanitarian missions and not for the so-called um, potential abuse in... Uh, human rights uh, violations and other campaigns involved in the gut in the drug war may ganun eh kaya na cancel eh so maybe we'd like some information okay. on that then uh, ako naman ang concern ko for following up that subject matter is the ground used by the cancelling uh, party diba it could it could be some other treaty it could be uh, not the ATT so uh, yun ang gusto ko ring malaman siguro but if you're not ready to share the information now, in writing, uh, that will be most welcome. Uh, the, our committee secretary will follow up. Okay? Ang, ang, ang mahirap lang kasi they're not obliged to give us a reason eh. And sometimes yes, they, yes. Give Tamar, Tamar very, uh, they give us very mundane reasons that are not important to real cause. <laughs> the sovereignty yan. Kapag India, India does not need to explain. Even sa ARCEP, umalis ang India. You don't need to explain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, okay, so uh, Senator Tolentino is uh, not online. So, okay, uh, on my list kasi is... Uh, ayan, okay, Senator Tolentino. Senator Tolentino, let's try again. Try again. Yes, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now, Mr. Chairman? Ang, hira, ang hina ng connectivity rito. I'm, I'm inside my Senate office. This is the... That's Senate the same office. problem with me. Uh, yes, same problem. problem with me, sir. <laughs> so I'd, I'd just like to follow up the, the oh, statement okay. given by Senator Gachalian. Ah, wala na naman. Na wala okay. Na naman. Uh -huh. Ako ba na wala? <laughs> Can you hear me, Mr. Eh. Chairman? Both answer. Okay po kayong dalawa. 
Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Perhaps the not not repeated word buzzword right now should be black market. Ah, uh, lang po yung idagdag ko na sa statement ni Senator Gutierrez. Black market. How can ATP prevent that? Is there a need for local, meaningful domestic legislation so we can prevent that? The, the good ambassador mentioned our long cost line, among others. So it's a the, the mere signing of this, the ratification of this treaty would not solve the problem. We we agree, uh, but it will give us more, give us a semblance of being a a law-abiding citizen among the community of nations. Uh, that's it, uh, Mr. Chair. Nawawala po ako. Okay, sorry, ako ang nawala. Mm. <laughs> Sayo, Dr. Lentino, ako po ang nawala. So, I, I missed your question. So, was it a question? So, who can answer the question? Just yes, a manifestation. Ah, manifestation only. Ah, sige. So, if that's the case, if nobody needs to react, we can now hear the inputs of the DTI. Kasi na-mention ni Atty. Dano ito, uh, STMA, uh, our law, which I think is implemented by the STMO under yes. the DTI. Can, who is uh, representing DTI? Katibayan, sir. Director Katibayan. Saan si Director dito? Ah, yes, sir. Yes, I'm, I'm Mr. Chair. Yes, yes, Mr. Chair. Um, honorable senators, um, government, uh, colleagues in government, and fellow research persons, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting us to this public hearing and for allowing us to share our views on the ratification of the Arms Trade Treaty. DTI fully supports uh, the ratification of the AT. Being a state party to the treaty will allow the Philippines to participate in decision-making on treaty amendments and matters related to treaty implementation, demonstrate our country's commitment to contribute to global efforts in the management of conventional arms, boost our reputation as a country as a safe trading environment, which builds investor confidence in the country, and gain access to a voluntary trust fund, which state parties can avail of to build the capacity of our national regulatory agencies. We know that Republic Act 10697, or the Strategic Trade Management Act, and its implementing rules and regulations have already established the legal framework for the Philippine implementation of the ATT. The STMA was enacted to fulfill the Philippines' international obligations, including the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1540, which prevents the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and other re related weapon system. The ATT, on the other hand, standardizes state actions towards regulating conventional weapons and their transfers, which the STMA already regulates. The specific provisions of the STMA that fulfill the general requirements of the ATT have been outlined in the position paper we have previously submitted. We would also like to take this opportunity to inform the body of the steps the STMA has undertaken to ensure compliance with the ATT. We have exerted efforts to harmonize the STMA with other related regulations such as the Comprehensive Firearms Law. We are formalizing an agreement concerning overlapping items regulated under both pieces of legislation with the Philippine National Police Firearms and Explosives Office to minimize the regulatory burden on stakeholders, particularly firearms exporters and importers. Both agencies are considering applying the same risk assessment criteria in our processes, taking into account the provisions of the ATP. Further, under Section 15 of the STMA and in support of the government's defense modernization program, STMO has issued 19 license exemption certificates to the Department of National Defense. We have taken note of industry stakeholders concerned that the ATT will impose controls that will place the Philippines at the mercy of ATT state parties, resulting in denials of arms import. In response, the STMO concurs with the DND's 2018 position and the ATT that the decision to allow or deny the import of arms is based on criteria set and discretion exercised by the exporting state. Ratification of the ATT assures exporters worldwide that the Philippines has national controls consistent with global standards. It will not hamper, but rather facilitate the trade in conventional arms. We at the DTI-STMO envision the Philippines as among the parties 
that lead in the implementation of the ATT and other in international instruments on conventional arms in the region. By setting an example, we hope to encourage neighboring states in Asia to accede and ratify the treaty and to contribute to achieving the ATT's goal, preventing and eradicating the illicit trade and diversion of conventional arms. In closing, DTI-STMO reiterates its support for the Senate's concurrence with the President's ratification of the Arms Trade Treaty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any questions to DTI-STMO from uh, members? Okay. Sige. Uh, you, you just mentioned, sir, uh, that Director Katibayan, that the STMA uh, already an provides the legal framework for the ATT, uh, anticip anticipated na pala yung ATT, when we were drafting the STMA? Yeah, it, it, it was a coincidence, uh, sir, because um, because of practices worldwide with respect to export controls, uh, it has become a global standard to come up with uh, uh, regulations on uh, firearms. And it so happened that the standards that apply uh, to the ATT are also applicable to uh, global standards on the regulation or export controls of uh, firearms. Uh, may I ask uh, Ambassador Concepcion, uh, once we uh, adopt this uh, this treaty, will will this be self-executing or is the STMA sufficient or do we need do, do you foresee that we need to enact some other laws to implement the treaty? Your Honor, uh, after we will uh, ratify the treaty. We have 90 days uh, for the treaty to um, be in effect. But uh, yes. for um, the STMO and FEO, there are certain overlaps which uh, actually are presently addressed, although it's uh, practically less of a memorandum of agreement, but uh, it, it has already been raised to the uh, NSC STMCOM, uh, and uh, this is being uh, formalized uh, at this moment so that these overlaps will be solved. There are also other uh, um, issues that uh, come into being in the implementation of uh, these laws, STMA, CFMA, and there, there's uh, these three laws, but uh, like STMO, it is experiencing birth pains. So that's uh, probably one of the birth pains that they are experiencing right now, being a new new office. And uh, they are very dynamic. STMO is very dynamic to uh, make arrangements with FEO to resolve these issues and hopefully come up with um, at least a resolution from STMCOM to make everything uh, formal and, uh, of course, legal. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ambassador. So you mentioned STMO overlap with and is that FEO? Yes, Was that yes, FEO? Sir. Yes, sir. Is, is that the Firearms and Explosives Office, Office. Yes. of PNP? Um, yes, sir. Because of the okay, so, uh, items uh, being covered. Yes. But, uh, so, yes. Yes, sir. Maybe we can hear from the... Ah, yeah. Oh, okay. Director, what's your name? Director, yes. Yes, sir. Just to provide additional input, Article 2 of the Arms Trade Treaty provides for eight types of uh, conventional arms. Um, the, all of uh, these conventional, of these eight types, only one, uh, one type overlaps uh, the firearms that are covered by the Comprehensive Firearms Law, which the Firearms and Explosives Office implement. And these are on small arms and light weapons. For all the other seven types, these are not regulated by the, by the FEO. And therefore, there is no overlap. So with respect to the small arms and light weapons, we are already in discussions with the FEO 
on how we can minimize the regulatory burden to uh, exporters and importers of these types of uh, uh, firearms. Uh, a, a paragraph two of Article two of the Arms Trade Treaty also covers uh, the scope of activities that are regulated by the Arms Trade Treaty. And these are export, import, transit, transshipment, and brokering, which are the same activities that are regulated by this Strategic Trade Management Act. So that's where the overlap uh, happens. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so can we hear from... So but, but your objective is that uh, not to over-regulate the letter H, no? Yung letter H. Kasi otherwise, dalawa kayong, dalawa kayong makikialam dun. So, okay, so can we hear from the PNP? Uh, uh, since the FEO has been mentioned, tuloy na natin sa PNP muna. Who will speak for the PNP? Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, the Chief uh, Parents Explosive Office, uh, sir. Police Brigadier General Romil Mitra, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, that is yes, fair, General uh, with regards to the comment of uh, the STMO. Uh, for the FEO, sir, what we are regulating, sir, are weapons, uh, including ammunitions, that are below 100 millimeters, sir. These are all small arms and light weapons. These are the types of firearms and ammunition that we are regulating, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, so basta you 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 confirm that you are in dialogue now with the STMO. Para you 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 are uh, already anticipating, you know, anticipating the ATT, so that uh, we will not overregulate the letter H, small arms and uh, light weapons. Tama? Yes, Mr. So confirm po. You're yes, confirming it. Oh, okay, good, good. Because uh, it might we may need to amend the law. We, so we the inputs will come from uh, your two offices. Okay, so that's good that the, the two offices are in in dialogue now. Okay, so uh, if, is that all the PNP you know, uh, position on ATT? Yan alam po yon. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Sino pa po? Mr. Chair. Please. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, perhaps we can ask General Warren De Leon. Perhaps we can ask General Warren De Leon to, to confirm the statement uh, previously made by General Mitra. General Warren uh, belongs to my, uh, I belong to his famous class, class 1993. General Warren. Is General Warren De Leon here? Yes, sir. Comsec? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so go ahead, General. Your Honor, with regards to the answer, the 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 here I think the uh, uh, suggest that the the ATT should be aligned to the RA Bank to use its center room or the strategic trade management app. Perhaps you can remove your face. I'm sorry, sir, it's the the audio is not clear. Ah, okay, ma'am. Ito po okay na po. Ma'am, okay na po. Okay. So, for the uh, PNP, the additional, additional input, the, uh, with regards to the unpaid listing, uh, it could be, uh, we recommend that it could be aligned with the RA 1667 or the Strategic Trade Management Act. And as I uh, already discussed uh, earlier, the. Sir, maybe you can remove your. I have a companion here in the conference room. Um, I am not playing up on my. The mic, the mic may be too far away. Ah, then the general, Masado Bamalayo, you mic mo. I am using a microphone. Your microphone. Okay, I think. How do you hear me here? Okay, Paul. Palabo pa rin po. Ito ma'am, okay na po. Sige, uh, 
<clears throat> sige, sige lang, General. Uh, just make your statement. We'll try our best to record and transcribe. If if not, ComSec, let's get a written statement if we can really not uh, get the statement. Ayan, ayan. Okay, si General. Yes. Okay na po. Magandang mo. Okay, sir. So, on the... Better, better. Uh, we suggest that the armed trade treaty should be aligned with the RA Republic Act 10697 or the Strategic Trade Management Act. And as also as discussed uh, earlier, the PNP plays a support role to the Special Envoy on Transnational Crime with regards to the realization of armed trade treaty as, as a as uh, said by Police Brigadier General Mitra. And uh, also the the Office of General Mitra already uh, submitted the position paper of the PNP to the, the, the Directorate of Plan. And uh, the APT has, uh, can help in uh, apparent procurement, and, but as uh, said by Senator Gatalian, the uh, illicit firearms uh, transportation or procurement from other countries will not uh, prevent that because uh, we have to 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 check our borders because uh, we are uh, recording uh, smuggling of firearms since 2017 and uh, it uh, comes from the port the Bureau of Customs uh, was able to intercept. Uh, firearms importation and also with uh, coming from the back door uh, being used by the the tourist service group in uh, Mindanao uh, it comes from the back door and also we are also transporting firearms going to other Asian countries that's all sir for uh, the Directory for Intelligence thank you for thank you sir thank you general uh next can we hear from the department of justice if they have uh, some statements to make if any lang po if any from sex sino sa doj uh good afternoon uh honorable chair uh attorney de jesus uh from the doj yes, yes attorney de jesus Yes, uh, we'd like just to manifest that we already provided as early as 2018 our position paper. And of course, uh, based on that paper, uh, we have no legal or constitutional objection to the treaty's uh, ratification. Thank you. Thank you for, for that uh, input. Uh, so... The chair, if the chair moves that if there is no objection from the members of the committee, that we make also part of our records all of the submissions to the committee in the last hearing under the the previous uh, chairperson of the committee. So, as mentioned by the DOJ, they submitted during the last hearing under Senator Loren at that time. Is that correct, uh, Comsec? The, the chairperson, of Senator Legarda. Yes. yes, sir. Okay. So, so if there's no objection from my committee members, okay, we will make everything, uh, all submissions there also part of our submissions. Yes, uh, Philippine Coast Guard. I cannot see your name, sir. Gavan. Uh, Rear Admiral uh, Gavan. Yes, sir. Good, good afternoon, yes, sir. Uh, Honorable sir. Chair and yeah. Honorable Members and colleagues. Sir, uh, please allow me to just manifest our support to the to this effort, uh, Mr. Chair, the Coast Guards finds it beneficial to promote transparency and accountability, and also to boost our moral high ground um, in terms of addressing the proliferation of firearms. Being an enforcement agency, it will help us in crafting better rules and regulations to control the movement of these firearms. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sir, additional chair. Thank you, sir. Commodore the sir. Commodore the Langin, please. Commodore the Langin, yes, sir. Yes, sir. From Coast Guard, sir. Commodore the Langin, sir. The Deputy Chief of Staff for Intelligence, CG2. 
I would uh, just like to add something, sir, that uh, the Philippine Coast Guard is, uh, uh, in relation to what uh, DTI-STM also said, the Philippine Coast Guard is working hand-in-hand -hand with uh, DTI-STMO on crafting appropriate protocols on uh, on how to to enforce the Republic Act 10697 or the Strategic Trade Management Act of 2016, the an act uh, to prevent the proliferation of uh, WMDs. We are a part of the of the subcommittee on enforcement, and we are now crafting appropriate protocols on how to enforce same same sir. Amray po salamat sir. Thank you, Commodore. Okay, Comsec, shall we now go to the private sector? Yes, sir. We can now okay. move to the private sector. Yeah, the private sector, especially the arms uh, manufacturers here in the Philippines. We have to hear them. Uh, maybe overregulation is one of their concerns. Who, who, who will uh, speak for and on behalf of the group? Arms for, sir. Mrs. Ang Ang Angko. Mama Ma Ang Angko from uh, Arms Corps. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, uh, our esteemed senators, Mr. Chair. I really appreciate all the comments that you have uh, given, uh, but um, I, I have submitted our position paper last August 28 and a new one last night. So I will just discuss what has not yet been taken up so as not to overburden also the time. So one of the first things uh, we should consider is that in the skirmishes in Mindanao with the terrorists and in other places in the country with the terrorists and the communists, um, the firearms there are not in the legal system. They are smuggled, illegally manufactured or stolen. Definitely these people will not bother getting a license to deal, a license to operate from the Philippine National Police or from the esteemed MO, nor will they apply for the appropriate uh, import and export permits. Also, legal airlines and shipping lines will not accept these products without proper import and exports being presented at the same time. So none of these firearms will ever be part of the AT&T report. All right. So, um, uh, the other thing, well, I mentioned about blacklisting and embargo, and uh, I, we don't know the reason why, but recently um, all the dealers have said, including us as a manufacturer, have said that our import permits from the United States are more, the exports from the United States, the permits have not been signed for many months now. So, so many things are pending. We're trying to find out why it's not being done. Oh, it's a okay. ATTN, why? Um, and then the other thing is the standardization. The AT&T seeks to standardize uh, the rules and regulations in international trade. Our Philippine National Police FEO is doing a very good job and we have very stringent rules. Our rules are actually stricter than in other countries around the world. If I may cite quickly, for example, we consider a barrel in the Philippines as a firearm and subject it to being registered as a complete firearm, whereas in other countries, it is only treated as a part. And only in the Philippines is stenciling and ballistic testing a requirement for all legal firearms for the PNP crime laboratory to have data in case a crime is committed with a legal firearm. From PNP statistics, crime using legal firearms is less than 1%. Also, to transport our firearms that are registered and legally owned, the owner has to apply for a permit to transport and a permit to carry from the PNP. Um, in other countries, this is not required. On top of that, during the election gun ban, the owner has to apply for an exemption from the commission election to transport his firearms, aside from getting the permits from the PNP. And under the National Strategic Goods List, which we have adopted, pushed by the European Union, rimfire rifles and ammunition are not regulated because hunting is a popular sport in Europe. In the Philippines, these are highly regulated by the PNP FEO. So the question is, will the Philippines now adopt the less stringent international standard? So that's what we want to know also. And then 
um, also, uh, we have a, the Philippines is an importer of conventional weapons. Based on the statistics in 2020, um, the Philippines imported 349, $349 million dollars of arms. Our exports will probably account for less than 10% of that, meaning we need to import almost everything that we need. So we would like to also push that we have a lack of a Philippine defense industry. The Philippine lacks the necessary raw materials to sustain a defense industry. In addition, RA 914, the procurement law that requires public bidding for government procurement is detrimental to investment in manufacturing defense item. This pandemic has caused havoc on the supply chain around the world. Many shipping lines have downsized and stopped some of their shipping routes. Ports are con congested, especially ours, causing birthing delays. Suppliers around the world have been affected, so uh, importations in a timely manner and the quantities needed is a challenge. So we urge the Senate, maybe this is not the proper uh, forum, but many of you are members, uh, we are pushing for the self-reliance in defense by passing SB 304, the Philippine Defense Industry Development Act, introduced by Senator Juan Miguel Subiri so that we can once again stand on our own and be proud of our self-reliance in defense program, which was started in, uh, in the 70s by Philippine President Marcos, but sadly it died. And then we should be able to revive that so that we will not be dependent on the policies of other countries in stopping us from getting the goods we need. So um, also, in, I won't go through the rest anymore because it's already in the paper, but to achieve the reduction in human suffering caused by illicit arms trade, focus and resources should be on enforcement of existing laws, like clamping down on illegal manufacture and illegal trading and smuggling, focusing on crime prevention more than crime solution, and controlling more the control is not the solution. So we can urge the United Nations to help our government and fund the stop to illegal manufacturing and smuggling in the Philippines. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. But, but of, overall, are you ag against uh, the ratification of this uh, treaty? Yes. Is your group or your, your company? Ma'am, nakamute kayo. We do not believe that the arms trade treaty is helpful to us. We have had many experiences where uh, our permits have been stopped and we had to go through a long process of going to the ambassadors to try to seek help because they say uh, we have human rights abuses in our country. Um, we also uh, feel that this is an added bureaucracy because there are also many overlapping between the FEO and the STMO. So we have registered in both and we're afraid that we have, will have to now go through a third agency, the Office of the uh, Transnational Crime. So we don't think it, it will help us. So we cited why it's disadvantageous in our position paper. And also it's an expense. Okay, we but... are contributing to a fund to uh, implement the arms trade treaty, but we are not benefiting from it. Okay, but but the all of these uh, experiences that you are uh, that you have uh, experienced right now are while we are still not yet a uh, member of the treaty. So, meaning to say that maybe. Uh, the existence of the treaty, there's no escaping anymore the existence of the treaty, the wide reach of the treaty, because you, you're you dealing with the countries which are members of the treaty. So, baka po, ano, baka po it's wrong to blame the treaty because it's already, it's really there. Wala na po tayong takas dyan eh. We're, we're not, uh, uh, Mr. Senator, Mr. Chair, we're not blaming the treaty. We just feel that it doesn't answer any of our problems or the the reasons why we are adopting the treaty. Oh, kasi pagdating sa overregulation, maybe uh, 
remedial legislation can can help no yung over yung over regulation maybe uh, some amendments to existing laws which will clarify who has jurisdiction this can help you pero okay but uh yung benefits so ambassador conception yung benefits ang kailangan nating ibenta lalo na sa plenary discussion yan because when we defend the this treaty uh, uh, the question the logical question is how will the country be benefited and if we have the if we have a defense industry now saying that they will be uh, affected detrimentally uh yun ang ano doon that is what we have to now uh, address ambassador uh, conception may, may I get your ideas um mr chair Thank you so much for the opportunity to reply, or right to reply. Um, I, I'm actually, um, I, I would li like to know which country was uh, Mom Gina, um, uh, she was mentioning a country of destination for their exports. Uh, what country was that? No, uh, we we have no problem in um, in our exports because our we have a very limited capacity. We only uh, uh, we only have up to uh, pistols. We don't have any of the high powered firearms, and everything we do is very regulated. Uh, but when we we have lack of raw materials, so when we try to import raw materials from other countries, sometimes. Uh, we're not allowed. Like uh, one time from Italy, our our imports from Italy were were stopped. So I had to go through a long process of talking with the ambassador here, the ambassador in the in uh, Italy, just to get it going. And also right now from the United States, we are not getting our um, uh, export permits, even for raw materials. Uh, I would like to. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would like to cite that we are not yet a state party and they're experiencing that. So uh, it, that makes no difference whether we are a state party or not. If there's a deficiency in your application, uh, uh, your application will turn out to be uh, disapproved. Now, um, you mentioned our office, uh, but uh, there, there's only one or a few instances which we were consulted uh, with respect to uh, the approvals of uh, end user uh, certificates or narratives, because this is part of due diligence as uh, as a, a country of uh, origin of our of our exports, uh, the pistols that you're producing, uh, we make sure that they will this will not be used uh, by other uh, state uh, actors or non-state actors for human rights and. Uh, uh, international law violations. So we, we're just assisting them because uh, our office has a diplomatic clout uh, above any other office uh, um, connected to um, the strategic trade uh, or the, the trade of conventional arms. Now, uh, although you refuse to mention the country which your exports are distinct to, uh, I, I, I will like to respect uh your um i would like to respect that but uh hopefully uh those destination countries of your exports are not also um in in the uh, red list uh, or sanctioned countries so uh or at least uh not uh um along the list of uh, good uh, reputation. So, uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, if I may, we have no problems with our exports because uh, everything we do is legit and above board and we're very careful with what we do. We have problems with importing raw materials that are, are not available in the Philippines because it may be used for, um, uh, because of the Philippines, the nature of the Philippines. Okay, mom. Uh, thank you so much. But uh, this is the first time, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, I, I heard about uh, the raw materials uh, being um, 
uh, stopped from being transported to the Philippines or traded to the Philippines. But uh, um, because I don't know the merits of the case, I, I cannot for sure yes, yes. give you. Okay. That's okay. That's okay, uh, Ambassador. Uh, I, na, nag-share lang ng experience sa atin si Ma'am Ang Angko. Uh, it's not because of the recipient corporation, but it's the dis- the reputation of the destination country. <laughs> Yun siguro ang more, more, that's the more problematic uh, point. But uh, on, before I recognize Senator Marcos, Ma'am Ang Angko, uh, are you speaking for and behalf of your company or an organization? If organization, please name the organization. Um, Mr. Chairman, the organization I head is the Firearms and Ammunition Manufacturers Association of the Philippines. We are also members of the Association of Firearms and Ammunition Leaders, and their president, I think, is present right now, Mr. Topasho. Okay. Okay. So, so yung, yung, yung position ninyo is the position of that organization that you mentioned. They, they adopt your position. The association adopts your position. Yes, the sir. manufacturers. The FAMA, yes. Okay, Manu- para klaro po. Okay. Yes, Senator Marcos, you, you, you wanted to say something? Like, parang yes, nag-raise sorry, ka ng kamay. Uh, yes, we've been in touch with the firearms and ammunition manufacturers in the past um, under my Committee on Economic Affairs. And uh, it is thought that this is one of the areas which we need to develop and invite uh, foreign investment. So... Their concern is that the ATT uh, signing would dissuade investors, in fact, and uh, make it difficult for our potential exporters or manufacturers who don't export but supply locally um, to uh, carry on. So, yun yung concern ko kasi dun sa Foreign Investments Act, Senator Recto is very concerned that uh, we should delete the for export limitation on manufacturing because even locally, we're in dire need of weapons here in the Philippines. Isa pa, you must be aware that there are uh, pending bills both in the House as well as in the Senate for special defense export processing zones particularly to address the lack of weaponry and manufacture here in the Philippines and endowing these uh, locators in these zones uh, in Bataan, for example, under Congressman uh, Joet Garcia, uh, with incentives so that they will produce weapons. So, lahat sila may concern na yung ATT hindi makakatulong kundi magiging hadlang sa kanilang uh, pagpapalawak ng negosyo at industriya. Thank you. Okay, we, we will just uh, go over the position papers and look for that reasoning. Bakit magiging uh, mas, mas hadlang pa or detrimental? I mean, the point is, you, you can. Uh, they're saying that the uh, treaty will not be beneficial to their industry, but will in fact be detrimental. So the, we, we have to take a look at that. that that's a very serious uh, uh, allegation, no? Uh, if something is detrimental to an industry, we have to look. We have to look into it. Okay, I think, so I think this was raised uh, in the. Sorry, I think this was yes. raised in the in the discussions uh, of the ATT previously under Senator Legarda, where the yeah. additional bureaucracy burdens for the legitimate manufacturers, uh, paperwork, the requirement to set up a special office for this, and so on and so forth, that have been raised um, tangentially also earlier in this hearing. Yes, we, we will make parts of the records of this present committee, all the position papers submitted in, in the uh, previous, uh, previous committee, under the previous committee chair, as well as the transcript of the hearing, Siguro, ComSec, com, com and then Okay, uh, can we listen to the other uh, private sector participants or here? How about the uh, Association of Firearms and Ammunition Dealers naman, of the Philippines? Are yes, they sir. present? Mr. Hagen Topasio, sir, and company. Uh, Mr. Topasio, you want you you want to share uh, your sentiments? Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair. I have a statement. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, good afternoon, Your Honors. I'm Hagen Topasio, President of the Association of Firearms and Ammunition Dealers of the Philippines. We'd like to thank the Honorable Committee for inviting AFAD to these proceedings and for opportunity to provide our position on the proposed ratification of the Arms Trade Treaty. We earnestly believe that the Arms Trade Treaty must not be ratified 
because it is disadvantageous to the country for the following reasons. As stated by Mrs. Ang Angko, the ATT may weaken Philippine regulations on the firearm industry. The firearms industry is already heavily regulated in the Philippines more than in other countries. The ATT would require the Philippines to apply international standards and definitions of conventional weapons contradictory to Philippine laws, which provide for stricter standards. For example, a barrel in the Philippines is already considered a firearm, hence subject to regulation, but it in other countries, the barrel is just a firearm part. Adopting international standards may weaken Philippine regulations. Number two, the ATT will add another layer of bureaucracy and expense, but will not address the surge of illegal firearms. Imposition of new local and multi-agency bureaucratic registrations and authorizations, in addition to the highly controlled procedures of the Philippine National Police, would further complicate the regulation of an already heavily regulated industry. This does not resolve, but may even encourage loose firearms in the Philippines due to the administrative difficulties of additional regulation. Reporting requirements under the ATT will jeopardize our national security. The treaty will require us to report all our imports and exports, and this information will be shared by all member states, thereby informing those who wish to do our country harm of the weapons that we possess and those that we are capable of making. Unjustified claims of human rights violations will hinder the country's access to legal weapons. On mere suspicion that the country is involved in crimes against humanity, member states will not approve exports of conventional weapons even for government use. The country has already experienced a glimpse of the, the effort of this type of sanction when the United States refused to issue export permits for the Philippine National Police equipment on the ground of unconfirmed human rights violations. Respectfully, what is worrisome about asking for reconsideration from the vendor is that the fight may be over by the time the vendor has made its decision. The treaty enhances imbalances in our relations with other countries. China and Russia have not signed the arms trade treaty. The USA, Israel, and Turkey have not ratified the treaty. Our neighbors in Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand have not ratified the treaty. Indonesia did not sign the treaty. Those who have signed it and ratified the arms trade treaty are from the European Union, South America, and Africa. Maybe we should start asking why these countries, especially our neighbors, are not ratifying or signing the arms trade treaty. The treaty will diminish the country's ability to respond to military emergencies. The arms trade treaty is expected to constrain the importation of legal firearms, even for military requirements. During the Marawi siege two years ago, one of the factors which hindered the military's attempts to suppress the siege was its lack of access to conventional weapons. Restrictive import and export permit process, processes hampered our military's procurement of needed firearms and ammunition on short notice. These difficulties will multiply with the ratification of the treaty. The treaty will hamper the ability of our law-abiding citizens to defend their homes and themselves. The treaty's objective of reducing human suffering caused by illicit arms trade will ironically not be addressed with the ratification of the treaty. Philippine statistics show that 99.5% of crimes involving firearms were perpetrated with illegal firearms. If our people are denied access to legal firearms, criminal intrusions into their homes will escalate and they will turn to those firearms because of administrative difficulties. In sum, we respectfully submit that the country has nothing to gain by the ratification of the arms trade treaty. No economic benefit is expected from the mere ratification of the treaty. Instead, the treaty will expose the country to possibly increased international sanctions, and it sets the stage for the surrender of our national controls to unnecessary international regulations, not to mention the grave implications on national security. We would like to emphasize that the arms trade treaty seeks to regulate is the legitimate firearms trade and not the illicit arms trade. The illicit arms trade will never allow itself to be governed by any law, regulation, much more a treaty. The purported purpose of the treaty, which is the reduction of human suffering caused by illicit arms trade, can be better be met by measures to eliminate the illicit manufacture and trade in firearms. We believe that this is already accomplished under the existing laws and regulations in the Philippines, such as RA 10591 or the STMO. Thank you very much, Your Honors. Thank you for that uh, input. Uh, Comsec, the Practical Shoot Shooters Association, ba? They, do they want to also we be heard? We have attorney, Ray, but maybe, sir, we can... Yes, uh, we have attorney Raymond Francisco. Uh, do they have a, a position here on this issue? We'll give them time. 
Attorney Francisco, pero sabi mo kasi kanina, observer lang eh, kaya akala ko hindi siya mag- Or si ano na lang po sir, si okay. Mr. Fred Lubang of... Okay. Yes, yes, that's the next. Okay, so we'll now go to an NGO. I think this is an NGO, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Non-Violence International Southeast Asia. Mr. Lubang? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Magandang uh, Now, now the signal is bad, Mr. Lubang. The signal is bad now. Honorable Senator, Tanbat Sinai Asia is already in the region of... Yes, sir. Can you, sir. Can you, can you inform Mr. Lubang? His signal is na... I'll just stop the video. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. Sir, yes, sir. Maybe, Comsec, can you hear him? Because I cannot hear him. He's not talking now, sir. So, hindi po so, siya nagsasalita. So, I don't know what happened. Need... Try to call, sir. Okay na ba? Na... Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, po. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Um, magandang, hap magandang hapon po sa lahat, Honorable Senators and everyone here. Uh, maraming salamat. I'm Fred Lubang. I'm the Regional Representative of Nonviolence International Southeast Asia, an NGO based here in the Philippines. I, at the outset, uh, I, I would like to reaffirm the uh, statement of DND Attorney Norman Daanoy. We were together during the negotiations of the treaty uh, way back uh, uh, years ago in New York. Um, so we have submitted our position papers um, to both the previous hearing and to this current hearing. So I, I won't repeat those uh, statements, but I would just like to respond to the issues raised uh, by all senators and our resource person. First, if we find and if we ratify the arms trade treaty in the eyes of the international community, we are a responsible, accountable arms recipient or trader. It's like a, 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 an indicator that we are serious of not make of making sure that the weapons that goes to our borders won't fall into the wrong hands. That's the first one. On the second one, on the arms embargo, we agree with the statement by the Department of Foreign Affairs that arms embargo imposed on a particular country is not within the arms trade treaty state parties decision. It is a separate UN Security Council decision. However, let's just put an example. If a country has been uh, sanctioned of an arms embargo and that country ratifies the arms trade treaty, that's even a plus positive point that indeed that country now is taking seriously and being responsible that those weapons that goes into their border or goes out of their border are made sure that it does not go into the wrong hands. Third point, on standardization. We all know, for those who are involved in negotiations at the United Nations, those agreements, those consensus are the common denominator, meaning they all went to compromises. Attorney Daanoy mentioned, we, the Philippines, were strong to make sure that the arms trade treaty does not restrict us from modernizing our armed forces. And we were successful in lobbying that, that it goes to that arms trade treaty. So again, treaties are compromises. However, if our national laws are stronger than the global standards, well, we are the gold standard then. 
we should be very proud, and I have been very proud over the years working on humanitarian engagement involving weapons from banning landmines, banning cluster munitions, regulating uh, IEDs, banning uh, land, uh, nuclear weapons. All of these treaties, Philippines have been aligned and actually showed leadership. This is the uh, few remaining treaties that would put Philippines on top of the most humanitarian compliant country in Asia if we ratify this treaty. What remains is the Protocol 5 of the CCW uh, 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 ratification. On the point of added bureaucracy, we trust and give this uh, reply to the Philippine National Police and the DTI STMO. But what they have reassured, as we have heard, is that, yes, if this is a trading that concerns life and death, we should take this seriously. We should be burdened, actually, to make sure due diligence is really being done so that this weapon does not end in the wrong hand. We have seen that from uh, massacre of the Ampatuan, massacre Maguindanao to the Maute uh, group in Marawi, we have to make sure why were the weapons in the first place and in with this group or ammunition, we have hundreds of thousands of ammunition, where do it come from? Now, when you reply back, are we uh, capable? Are the, uh, our own national laws can apply to it? Uh, I have to say that arms trade treaty is just one of the many international obligations we have to make sure that illicit weapons does not end into their own hands. We have the UN program of action. We have the firearms protocol of the transnational crime. We have the banning landmines treaty. We have the cluster munitions treaty. We have the uh, banning nuclear weapons and so forth. And many arms embargo. This is not just and trade treaty working. This is about making sure that we are responsible traders of weapons. So if, uh, uh, again, I would like to reassure the arms industry, it is good for the arms industry. Imagine uh, you would be reflected that indeed the Philippines ratified that treaty. They are responsible and obligated to follow these procedures, making sure that these weapons does not end in the wrong hands and the problem that was raised, the cases that the U.S. stopped uh, a particular shipment or another country stopped, I think, the, and I am very much uh, positive on this, that the arms trade treaty would indeed contribute to making sure that we comply with the global standards and, and the request would be reconsidered and it's just about going through the due, due diligence process and administrative process, making sure that these weapons indeed went into the proper authorities uh, and responsible uh, gun holders. Um, lastly, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, we uh, as a, an NGO that has been helping uh, the Office of the Special Envoy in Transnational Crime or the Office of the President have over the years built the capacity of our agency because the question that was raised uh, particularly by Senator uh, Gachalian come arms flows end up into the non-state armed groups? The answer to that is complex. If we ratify with the arms trade treaty, we are obligated that we have to make sure that these weapons does not end into the wrong hands. So if the problem would tell us that the problem is with the storage management of our police or our armed forces that are easily raided by the uh, armed group and they could easily uh, steal those weapons, then we built a better storage management system. If the problem is with the fake documents that are being uh, forged, then we have to increase our skills. And these capacities are part of the international cooperation and, and assistance that will be provided among state parties to make sure that we, were, we are able to comply with our obligations. If the problem is about making sure that this weapon ends up in the wrong hands, then this procedural, and we, we also agree that there is indeed harmonization of all these laws. I think the, the key there is striking the balance. 
And I believe that our legislators would see that, that indeed there are valid points uh, by the industry, but that does not uh, uh, convince us that we have to disregard the arms trade treaty. The arms trade treaty is our, uh, let's just say, a gold standard that we are indeed a responsible country, uh, responsible to make sure that these weapons uh, does not end in the wrong hands. So with that, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, colleagues yes, and, and friends, uh, thank you for allowing us. Thank you for your contribution. Uh, Comsec, should uh, you have the Red Cross here? Yes, sir. We have, sir, Attorney Georgia Hines. Oh, so we, we will allow the Red Cross to uh, tell us their... Uh, sentiments about this ATT, but if you can keep it uh, straight to the point, ma'am, uh, because we're running out of time already. Yes, Red Cross. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Chair, Senators, um, esteemed representatives, Maraming Salamat, and thank you for providing the opportunity for the ICRC to speak. So, um, as you would know, we are a global humanitarian organisation with a specific mandate in conflict. So, um, firstly, I'd like to commend the committee and the government more broadly for considering this important treaty as was pointed out in your opening remarks, Honourable Chair. It was an ICRC study in 1999 that was one of the catalysts for the ATT, and that study found that the widespread availability of weapons can increase tensions and civilian casualties. It can hamper the delivery of assistance and facilitate violations of IHL. So respect for this instrument is really critical to ending those cycles of armed conflict and other situations of violence and preventing human suffering. So we're very pleased that the Philippines has acted as a champion and advocate for the ATT for years, and we'd really encourage them to do so, um, to play a leading role, especially in this region, because the ATT is lacking uh, representation from Asia, so that is sorely needed. Now, to come straight to some of the questions that the committee has been looking at, um, and fortunately, uh, Mr. Fred LeBang has eloquently dealt with many of them, so just to reinforce some points. In response to the Honourable Committee's questions about how the ATT can assist in issues related to illicit trafficking and manufacturing here in the Philippines, I would re-emphasise that the ATT isn't the only instrument. This does not cover the field in terms of arms control. It complements and it strengthens a number of other international instruments and processes. We have the UN program of action to prevent, combat and eradicate the illicit trade in small arms and light weapons. And um, as Ambassador Bruce Concepcion would know well, the Philippines is a very active participant there. There is also the protocol against illicit manufacturing of and trafficking in firearms. What the ATT does is it requires transfers to be assessed against those international agreements, in particular the ones relating to the transfer or illicit trafficking in conventional arms. It also contains provisions that encourage the parties to share information with each other on effective measures to address what's called diversion, essentially where weapons end up in the wrong hands. So that includes cooperation on things like international trafficking routes, illicit brokers, um, destinations used by organised armed groups that are engaged in diversion. And this is the kind of thing, uh, cooperation, that can help to tackle those kinds of transnational crime issues. Um, further, the, the national control systems that we've heard about that are implemented under the ATT will generally include tracking systems for stockpile management, and that's to help prevent leakage or theft of weapons into the wrong hands. Again, that diversion that I was talking about. And actually, one of the resource persons on this call, Mr. Alistair G from the Centre for Armed Violence Reduction, uh, his organisation specialises in rolling out software for states to assist them in better marking and tracking weapons and managing stockpiles. So there is that kind of assistance available that is one benefit that the Philippines could access as a party to the ATT. 
So just to say that in that way, the ATT is part of a broader system that's designed to address precisely that kind of weapons diversion uh, and indirectly the illicit manufacture and trafficking that we've been discussing. And then to come to the questions from the committee regarding specific export authorization cases um, in relation to the parts or components to the Philippines. So um, those parts or components are covered by the arms trade treaty, but um, the ATT doesn't provide for anything in the way of an arms embargo. It doesn't allow for blacklisting or sanctions. That is not part of the treaty. Instead, it actually requires that states implement the provisions in what is called a consistent, objective and non-discriminatory manner. Uh, and as our, um, uh, as our resource persons from DFA have noted, there are other regimes in the system, in the UN system, that already allow for the imposition of sanctions or embargoes. And at any stage, states will remain free to apply additional controls beyond the requirements of the ATT for a range of reasons, and that could be anything including down to reputational risk, but they sit beyond the remit of the ATT. I would also point out the US, who we've uh, we've been speaking a lot about exports to the Philippines from the United States, and the the United States is not currently party to the ATT, so it is applying its own system to any export authorizations. Further, I think, um, as has been stressed, it's, it's reasonable to assume that exporting states parties to the ATT would consider whether the importing state is a party to the ATT, because that indicates that the importing state has a strong national control system. And it also means there's more information about that system available through the treaty's reporting mechanisms. And I think it's relevant here to note that eight of the top 10 exporters of major conventional weapons in the world are party to the ATT. For the Philippines specifically, there are 17 out of the 20 countries that the UN register lists as the top exporters to the Philippines of small arms and light weapons. 17 out of the 20 are party to the ATT. And for major conventional weapons, it's half of the eight largest countries exporting to the Philippines. So these countries are already applying the ATT's criteria to these authorizations and the Philippines ratification and implementation of the ATT would arguably facilitate those deals. Um, finally, just in relation to the current regulatory environment in the Philippines, it's true the Philippines has good regulatory controls over licensing and they have key aspects such as offences for transfers of certain weapons without authorization. So there's no reason that those controls couldn't be used to satisfy many of the requirements of the ATT in terms of national implementation. And it does sound like there is uh, an appetite to standardize and harmonize these into potentially a more streamlined national control system, which is absolutely one of the benefits of the ATT, the fact that it can create that common standard across the international community, it can foster market certainty, and the Philippines can be looking to other states' parties to the ATT and accessing what is quite a large bank of national practice and other legislation that's already been enacted. Um, and the Philippines would be in a position to access international assistance for that purpose of implementation and also financial contributions under, um, there's a voluntary trust fund set up under the treaty. In fact, the Philippines has already received about a million US dollars under that fund for a capacity building relating uh, to the ATT. So um, that's an ongoing opportunity and there's no obligation to contribute money to that fund in order to be able to access it. It's a voluntary contribution. So they were the points I wanted to make and I hope that, th that I've made it brief, but thank you again thank you. to the Honourable Committee for allowing us to participate in this important hearing. Thank we you. remain available for questions and very happy to support in the ratification and implementation. Thank you, Chair. So thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Uh, Comsec, have we overlooked uh, any agency or group which uh, manifested its desire to participate? and share its position. Kung wala, uh, kung wala naman, uh, just uh, again, a reminder to all that 
the committee is open to yes. uh, inputs from anybody, government, private sector, NGO, in writing, please send to our uh, committee through to our committee uh, secretary. For the staff, uh, uh, please, yeah. please mute. Please put yourself on mute. Mm. Okay. Uh, siguro one question ako kay, ano, kay uh, Ambassador Bruce Concepcion, who is the most knowledgeable person about the wording. And, uh, kasama na natin si Attorney Daanoy doon who participated in the uh, drafting. Yung concerns, the concerns raised by the Association of Firearms uh, and Ammunition Dealers as well as the manufacturers, can this not be addressed by law, uh, by adjusting our laws, uh, given the fact that we, are, we admit that this is not a self-executing treaty anyway? But we need laws to execute uh, this treaty, uh, the, the concepts in the treaty, the framework of the treaty. So in, 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 in uh, drafting these laws, in passing these laws, can we not address now the issues raised by uh, those against the ratification of the treaty? Sige, ano muna? Uh, let's start with Ambassador uh, Bruce Concepcion. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. Um, the concern that you have raised actually gives us a hint that uh, indeed uh, or reinforced uh, our belief that uh, these laws uh, need to be uh, harmonized, at least harmonized uh, or amended uh, nonetheless. But uh, we also have to craft uh, new laws which will uh, allow us to apply all these international mechanisms, not just for ATT, but also um, other other uh, conventions, protocols, uh, and mechanisms, uh, especially those uh, that are um, revolving around uh, weapons of mass destruction. And uh, it is very timely that uh, if we will be able to ratify ATT, um, the next step would probably be uh, coming up with laws that will incorporate all this uh, uh, strategic trade, conventional weapons, nuclear weapons, biologi biological weapons, uh, provisions, uh, all these uh, uh, export and import controls uh, revolving around uh, weapons of mass destruction. But we have to first uh, ratify the ATT so that uh, the next step will be um, coming up with those laws that uh, you have uh, envisioned, uh, Mr. Senator. Okay, so Claro, Ambassador, uh, we can address the concerns raised by the manufacturers and dealers in the laws. Yeah, yes, sir. Actually, uh, most, of the, most of the concerns that they raised uh, ever since up to now are... Uh, can can easily be addressed with uh, demo, uh, the de diplomatic uh, um, domestic uh, laws, the crafting of domestic laws. Um, laws, okay, yes. And uh, it will actually not just improve uh, our systems uh, internally, but also our trading to external partners uh, in the industry. Right, right. Right. Okay. Uh, Attorney Danoy, uh, if, if if you have uh, res, uh, parang ano, response to my question? Uh, Mr. Chairman, the problem with our local uh, industries, defense industries, is not the ATT. It's our local laws. So it needs some uh, more legislation, national legislation, to assess or help our uh, local defense manufacturers. Wala, ko naki, wala kami nakikita ang problem dito sa ATT with regard to the our local industry. They can, they can go on, they can proceed with their uh, businesses. What we, are, what we want here in the ATT is control, national control. We have a very weak control on uh, small arms and weapons. So that's what our uh, observation, Mr. Chair, is not the ATT is the problem, it's our local laws. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, so, so tamang-tama, tamang-tama yun because 
uh, ratifying this treaty will be a reminder to us to revisit all of those local laws uh, connected with uh, uh, connected with the ADT. I think uh, my staff already mentioned not less than four laws. The uh, STMA, ano pa ba? Uh, CFL, uh, and then even the comprehensive uh, uh, tariff uh, code, CMTA, and then RA ninety five sixteen. So there may be some other laws that we have to that we have to revisit. So this will be this will be one of the uh, benefits in ratifying this uh, treaty is we are forced now to revisit all of these laws and address the concerns of the uh, local industry. Lalo na yung over-regulation, yung ganon. And then si Mr. Topacio yata uh, even raised the fact of uh, ano, over-transparency naman in the reporting. We, we are, parang yung cards natin, eh, nasa, nasa, ano na, nasa kitang-kita na ng buong mundo. But, but uh, uh, since this treaty is not really, ano, no, not, not self-executory, so it now depends on the final laws that we will uh, enact pursuant to the treaty, pursuant to our uh, sovereignty. So if, if there are any points, uh, Ma'am Lourdes uh, from the DFA, any, any final points on this uh, matter? Yusek Iparagire, if any. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Honorable Chair, just briefly, I think I just wanted to focus on technical cooperation. We mentioned earlier about national laws implementing the provisions of the treaty, and uh, that's one of the benefits that we're getting from this agreement, um, access for uh, support and assistance for capacity building in drafting legislations, in strengthening our institutions that will implement uh, this treaty and uh, other uh, related uh, agreements that we are state party to in in strengthening our enforcement agencies we have we will be having access to best practices of other countries uh, in implementing the treaty and also uh, it's really very important that we're in the loop um, we cannot prevent illicit transfers of arms by ourselves by the Philippines alone. It has to be international cooperation. And we have to be in the loop in terms of access to information, access to um, what was mentioned earlier, uh, tracking uh, uh, the flow of arms and monitoring the flow of arms. So these are some of the benefits that we'll be getting from the ATT than being outside of the ATT. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, ma'am. And then, siguro, reminder na lang nga to our uh, industry to be active when the bills which are filed uh, pursuant to this treaty will be discussed in the, in the legislature. Yon. Ayusin natin to make sure that the interests of the local industry will also be promoted, if not uh, protected. So, uh, if there are any, no, no more discussions, huh? ano na? And if there is no objection uh, from my colleagues here, uh, members of the committee, we shall now endorse the ATT uh, to the plenary for our concurrence. Okay. Okay, but uh, okay, so Senator Tolentino is giving us the thumbs up. But, okay. Okay, but we continue. Uh, we, con continue we continue reading. Again, again, sir. Again, sir. Continuing interpolation, Mr. Chairman. Yes, yes. Uh, we will continue uh, with our research and reading on the topic because uh, we will uh, we will go back to the previous uh, committee hearings about this. But but as, as of the moment, Mr. Chairman, uh, on the topic of black market and the illicit uh, trade of uh, weapons, Mr. Chairman. Yes, um, Mama Nganko. Yes, thank you. thank you, Mr. Chair. What I wanted to say is that we are very proactive and we are interested in any laws that, uh, or any discussions that we'll formulate. Last August 18, we were invited to the hearing and we were there. And actually, the chair then, Senator Legarda, was surprised that the 
different groups had not met prior to that. So she said that a TWG would be composed for the discussions. But since that time until today, this is the first time we um, we get to know of the discussions on this. But yes, if if uh, the committee uh, will allow, we would like to be invited to all the discussions. Because what we feel is that uh, we have enough laws, sometimes conflicting laws. What we need is implementation to really yeah. eradicate illegal manufacture and legal smuggling, which is the heart of the problem. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, that's that's that. We have the same uh, end result that we want to we want to achieve. Um, Nagaalala na rin po kami diyan sa mga illegal loose firearms para po sa kinabukasan ng aming mga anak din. Delikado na ang ating uh, lipunan. Pero okay, so but specifically on the ATT, uh, okay na. I think there was no objection. So we we will now uh, endorse this to the we'll draft the committee report. Uh, recommending concurrence by the Senate to the ratification of the ATT. So, as far as the ATT is concerned, uh, we will now uh, terminate that the subject matter. And uh, with the permission of uh, Senator Toll, maybe we can just tackle uh, one more item na lang, the resolution number 786, Southeast Asia Collective Defense Treaty. And we, we will, and then after that, we will suspend, and then some other time, we will take up his uh, Senate Resolution 8787, Defense Agreements with the United States. Okay. So, Senator Tolentino is, uh, is uh, giving me a gesture of approval. So, uh, let's now go to the second item in our agenda. But for those who are leaving us because they're done with their uh, business with the committee, maraming salamat po sa inyong participation in the ATT uh, discussion. Maraming salamat po. But DFA, do not do not go yet. We are we, we want now. We will now go to the resolution uh, directing the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations to conduct an inquiry in aid of legislation on the status of the Southeast Asia Collective Defense Treaty. Okay, so a preliminary statement from the author, Senator Tolentino. We might as well uh, require the continuing presence of the. Uh, Department of National Defense and uh, the Armed Forces of the Philippines, Mr. Chairman. Okay, DND, please stay. AFP, please stay. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, with your permission, uh, we will ask permission to be excused. Unless, unless you were involved in the Seattle negotiations, sir, in <laughs> 1954. <laughs> it's the defense matter. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. you. Okay. okay, na yung iba. Those who are those who are, those, who are, those who are no longer involved in the uh, Southeast Asia Collective Defense Treaty, you can you you can now leave us with with, uh, with thanks from the committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Okay. Chairman. We can even require thank the you, presence of the Philippine National Police. Philippine National Police can go. No, no, can stay, Mr. Chairman. Can stay, can stay. Okay, Philippine National Police, you have been requested to stay. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, With your permission, Mr. Chairman, to expedite Yes, Secretary uh, Senator Tolentino. Yes, uh, if the DFA family is listening, and I, and I hope uh, they're still around, the reason why I filed this uh, resolution is really to inquire as to the status of the Southeast Asia Collective Defense Treaty of 1954, or the Manila Pact, knowing fully well that what was dissolved was the product agreement of the Manila Pact, which is the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. The Manila Pact was established 1954, while the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization was established February of 1955, and it was dissolved, I think, 1977. Uh, DFA family can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm, I'm, uh, particularly interested, Mr. President, because it appears at the present time, our existing mutual defense treaty with the United States is the sole anchor of our uh, extra, extra uh, territorial defense with another country, uh, and, and this involves the United States. But with the Southeast Asia Collective Defense Treaty, it will involve New Zealand, 
the United States, Australia, Thailand, and the United Kingdom. Apparently, uh, Mr. Chairman, Pakistan withdrew from the, the treaty in 1973, and France withdrew financial support, likewise in 1973. The reason why I'm invoking this is that the dissolution of the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization in 1977 would, would not automatically dissolve the mother treaty, which is the Southeast Asia Collective Defense Treaty or the Manila Pact. I am aware that the Department of Foreign Affairs has not been uh, actively construing the validity of the Southeast Asia Defense uh, Collective Defense Treaty, similar to the other treaties that we have with other countries. And I can recall, for instance, Mr. Chairman, that during a particular budget hearing, I raised the question of a of a treaty concerning fisheries, and apparently that treaty was uh, was was uh, signed in Baguio, and it's now based in Thailand. And I asked DFA then; they never answered. Uh, no offense to DFA, and this is the Asia Pacific Fisheries Commission uh, treaty. The reason why we are not active is apparently we're not paying dues, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. So. Uh, our inactivity would not mean that the treaty has been dissolved as far as the Philippines is, is concerned. The same is true, Mr. President, with the Southeast Asia Collective Defense uh, Treaty Agreement. Uh, we, we have, we have uh, our staff meticulously uh, browsed the regist registry of treaties of the ministries of the uh, foreign affairs of New Zealand, Australia, Thailand, United Kingdom and even the United States is part of their websites that they have yet, they have not yet withdrew from the uh, treaty or even uh, denounced the treaty or even terminated the treaty. So the issue here now is the the possibility of vestitude, uh, the diplomatic term for that, is the non-use of the treaty tantamount to the termination of the treaty. My position, Mr. Chairman is no. Uh, the Southeast Asia uh, Collective Defense Treaty has no termination clause. Uh, in fact, in Article 10 of the said treaty, the treaty, it says that the treaty shall remain in force indefinitely. So even while the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization has been dissolved, the Southeast Asia Treaty Defense, Collective Defense Treaty, as far as I have uh, read, is it still valid? So I'm asking that we be guided by the Department of Foreign Affairs, They're, they being the supposed to be the, the depository of all of all the uh, the signatures because it's the Manila Pact, as to the current status of the Southeast Asia Treaty, uh, the Southeast Asia Collective Defense Treaty. Nakalimutan na po ito, Mr. President. Kung ito po ay valid pa ay malaking tulong po ito para sa Pilipinas, lalong-lalo na sa usapin sa West Philippine Sea. Dahil magiging kakampi natin dito ang Australia at ang New Zealand na very active na rin sa usapin sa West Philippine Sea. So, having said that, Mr. President, uh, to, to expedite the proceedings, can I be allowed to uh, ask, aside from the preliminary statements, which can be considered as a barrage of questions, can, be, can I be asked, can I be allowed to ask directly the DFA uh, sige, some questions sige. para mapabilis po ito, Mr. Chairman? Sige, sir. Uh, Senator Tolentino, you will conduct the hearing. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay lang. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, hindi ko po alam kung sino pa ang DFA Us. na nandito dito ngayon. Attorney Jeffrey Batak, sir. DFA. Uh, Attorney Batak. Is he from the legal uh, treaties, treaties office? That's correct, sir. I'm from the Office of Treaties and Legal Affairs. Ah, yes. yes. Attorney Batak, apparently, you were still not around when this treaty was born. Uh, this was signed 1954. So, tama ba yung, yung sinabi ko kanina na buhay pa itong treaty nito? Um, thank you, Paul. Um, and 
I would like to greet uh, everyone, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, our, our guests, and our resource speakers. Good afternoon. Um, at the outset, uh, Your Honor, the department is of the view that the Manila Pact or the um, um, Southeast Asia Collective Defense Treaty is uh, already terminated and it is no longer in effect. When was it terminated, Attorney Bata? Um, the department notes that uh, in 1977, when Seattle uh, had its final meeting, they noted that um, due to significant change, in, fundamental change in circumstances, Seattle is no longer in use. And if I may be allowed, sir, Let to present the four. I, I, I know you're referring to the fundamental change of circumstances, known as the Rebus Sixtantibus Doctrine, but I'm, ref I'm referring to the Mother Treaty, the Southeast Asia Collective Defense Treaty, which gave birth to the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. So these are two different treaties. The Mother Treaty is uh, the Southeast, I have in my possession, the Southeast Asia Collective Defense Treaty, and I don't have in my possession any agreement that would point to its termination pursuant to the treaty itself, and pursuant to the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Uh, all the, all the uh, grounds for treaty termination, uh, the denunciation, withdrawal, etc., etc., have not yet been uh, provided for uh, Attorney Batak. So, sa records ko, ang nag-withdraw lang, nabanggit ko kanina, is Pakistan and France withdrew its financial support. But the rest, even if you look at the website of the United States uh, State Department, the treaty is still in force, uh, Attorney Batak. So, ang saan mo nakuha yung na-dissolve na? na? Ang dinissolve nila is the Seattle, is the Sito. Pero show me an agreement uh, signed by the state parties na dinissolve na rin itong Southeast Asia Collective Defense Treaty. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, we echo your sentiment. The department notes that Article 10 of the Manila Pact provides that the treaty shall remain in force indefinitely and that any party may cease to be a party one year after its notice of denunciation has been given to the government of the Philippines. Um, however, um, here at the department, we are of the view that the absence of notices of denunciation from the parties, including the Philippines, does not mean that the Manila Pact continues to remain in force. In fact, we take guidance from Article 54, Paragraph B of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which provides, uh, and I quote, the termination of a treaty or the withdrawal of a party may take place at any time by the consent of all the parties after consultation with the other contracting states. And um, we construe this consent as having happened uh, when the Seattle uh, issued its uh, final statement in on September 24, 1975. In that statement, the Council reviewed the events in the treaty area, uh, of course, including uh, Southeast Asia, where the Philippines is, and they considered the role of Seattle in light of the new situation in the Southeast Asia as um, having as no longer of value. So they know that the organization if had I over the years. Attorney Bata, again, yeah, the, yes, Your Honor. Your premise is on the alternatives. Uh, I have your Article 54 uh, in conformity with the provisions of the treaty, which was not complied with because the treaty is silent uh, on that. Or that's the alternative at any time by consent of all the parties after consultation with other contracting states. So what transpired during those dates in February? Uh, 1955 was the dissolution, dissolution of the CITO or SIATO, but not the Collective Defense Treaty. The Collective Defense Treaty is not just your treaty involving collective defense, but even cultural research. They even established a cholera laboratory in Dhaka, if you will research. So I is, is, there a, is there an existing uh, jurisprudential basis that the dissolution of a child treaty would be tantamount to the dissolution of the mother treaty? I do not see uh, any provision uh, from the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties concerning that. So what was, 
what was dissolved was just the SIATO, not the Southeast Asia Collective Defense Treaty. And again, I refer you, I refer you to uh, the websites of the various ministries that I mentioned. Even the United States, it's still there, plays as an active treaty. Uh, Your Honor, if I may. Hello. Oh. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Um, okay, so we note your comment that um, some parties still list um, this uh, treaty as um, still active. However, we are not in a position to um, to ascertain why. But uh, if the committee will allow, we will uh, the department will make representations with our counterparts to see um, to see their position on this. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, can I have a one minute suspension because somebody uh call me up yes uh we declare a one minute suspension To, to reiterate, uh, uh, are we? You want to resume, Senator? Yes, to the Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Okay, our hearing is uh, resumed. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman, uh, again, I reiterate the question: What was dissolved in 1955 was the Child Treaty of Seattle, but the Mother Treaty was not dissolved. If the DFA is uh, invoking that the dissolution of the product by product treaty would also entail the dissolution of the mother treaty i think they have to show to show this committee uh, an, an agreement to that effect or to show a provision within the treaty uh, which i have in my possession or the vienna convention of the law of treaties so the dfa mentioned change of circumstances as the basis uh, can you elaborate on that? Uh, what was the change in circumstances uh, that that would entail the dissolution of the mother treaty itself? Um, yes, Your Honor. Um, like what you said earlier, we uh, we apply the legal principle of rebus extantibus or fundamental change in circumstances as uh, codified in Article 62 of the BCLD. Um, first, let me just. Uh, Quote, paragraph A of this article, um, a fundamental change of circumstances which has occurred with regard to those existing at the time of the conclusion of a treaty and which was not foreseen by the parties may not be invoked as a ground for terminating or withdrawing from the treaty unless the existence of those circumstances constituted an essential basis of the consent of the parties to be bound by that treaty. So in the case of the Philippines, uh, we note that the country's policy uh, policy shift towards the establishment of diplomatic relations with uh, communist states like China, Russia, and Vietnam constituted a fundamental change in circumstances that pushed it towards its decision to dissolve the organization and ultimately to consider the Manila Pact as terminated. Uh, this represents a negation of the stated goals of Seattle as an international organization, which are, number one, to provide limited economic assistance and counter insurgency advice to its Southeast Asian members, Thailand and the Philippines, and number two, to prepare plans for an alliance uh, response in the event of a communist invasion of Indochina. In other words, uh, Your Honor, the impetus that prompted the Philippines to join Seattle and to agree to be bound by the Manila Pact is no longer availing at this point. Uh, the department notes that the country's formal diplomatic relations with the said countries uh, were established. You no, know, with China, it was established in 1975. With Vietnam and the and then USSR, now Russia is 1976 these diplomatic relations remain robust to this day. And so um, if we take a look at the totality of the circumstances, this uh, treaty was actually uh, concluded in response to what was then called the communist threat. But that threat no longer uh, is no longer existing or evading at this point, which is why it doesn't make a uh, uh, the treaty does not have any value anymore because those were its stated goals. 
to promote counterinsurgency and to assist the parties in case of a communist attack. Uh, there appears to be no uh, instance anymore when those uh, circumstances are availing at this point, which is why um, if the I may, department uh, is... interrupt the gentleman again. Uh, yes, Your Honor. So the determination now hinders, is, is hinged on uh, the interpretation of the DFA because of the Rebus Sixtantibus Doctrine, uh, Mr. Chairman. Although, Mr. Chairman, the, the again, uh, DFA has been referring oh, again and again, over and again to the Seattle Agreement when I'm referring to the Southeast Asia Collective Defense Treaty. The Southeast Asia Collective Defense Treaty is anchored on not just collective defense, peace and order, upholding principles of democracy, individual liberty, rule of law, promotion of economic well-being, and development of all peoples in, in the treaty area, which is still, which is still a, a valid foundational uh, basis, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I heard something, that the threat of communism, the uh, Department of National Defense, I, I hope you're listening, Philippine National Police, I hope you're listening, uh, armed forces, I hope you're listening. The threat of communism, according to the DFA, is no longer relevant. Pero, Mr. Chairman, the longest insurgency, armed conflict, communist armed conflict insurgency, is in the Philippines, Mr. Chairman. In fact, uh, we have been hearing over and over again the, the, the functions of the National Task Force to end local communist armed, for, armed, armed conflict. Which is a uh, which is a, a prime function now of the PNP and the AFP. In fact, Mr. Chairman, we just had an ambush the other day somewhere in Negros, and uh, the other day, other week in Mindoro. So, it's not true that uh, we have uh, the basis of the mother uh, treaty is to end communism. Although we have entered into diplomatic relations with China and other nations, that that does not eventually negate, dilute our own counterinsurgency problem, uh, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, hindi po tama na wala na tayong communist threat, uh, Mr. Chairman. Tuloy-tuloy pa ho yan. Kaya nga pinaiwan ko yung PNP. Uh, siguro 40% ng trabaho nila ngayon. Itong kul dito sa NTF, ECLAC. Uh, patuloy pa rin po yan. Sa ngayong mga darating na panahon, lalong-lalo na papasok tayo sa budgetary process, uh, Mr. Chairman. So, I don't see the mere entering into uh, diplomatic relations with with the communist countries as a as a, an application of the Rebus Sixtantibus Doctrine because we're still being confronted with the uh, communist uh, threat, uh, Mr. Chairman. Pinakamalaking budget na nga nabibigay natin dito sa NT, uh, NTF uh, ekla, alam siguro nila yan. So, how can now the DFA justify the dissolution of a treaty based on their interpretation when the other, the other state parties are still considering this as valid and extant, Mr. President? Valid pa sa kanila. Masama ba yung humingi pa rin tayo ng tulong sa Australia? sa New Zealand, sa Amerika, na nire-recognize pang valid yung treaty, samantalang tayo na may hawak ng treaty kasi Manila pa, ay ayaw na natin. Tayo nga yung may, may problema pa ngayon sa communist insurgency. I, I hope uh, the DFA uh, realizes what the, what, what the AFP and PNP are uh, confronting at the moment, uh, especially uh, with the NPA still. Uh, in existence. So, hindi pa tapos yung, yung bahagi nung, nung treaty na yun. So, paano nyo nasabi na meron ng change of circumstances? Eh, eh, ngayon, ang pinag-uusapan pa rin natin itong uh, CPP, NPA, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes, go ahead. Uh, um, sorry, Mr. Chairman. Um, Your Honor, I would just like to clarify that when I said the communist threat is no longer availing, I was premising it in the context of the communist threat when the treaty was concluded, which means threat that was um, emerging throughout the region, Southeast Asia, 
But uh, I understand your point. The communist problem we have now within the Philippines is a domestic issue that is uh, um, that isn't really within the scope of what the treaty um, entails. And so, um, if we also take a look at the treaty, um, I would like to cite some of the salient points. Um, Article 4 of the treaty provides that aggression by means of armed attack against any party or any attack which may not necessarily be armed, but which threatens or endangers the peace of the area is a ground for the parties to um, consider whether there should be uh, equivalent military retaliation. Um, however, the problem with this is that members or, or the parties should agree to be bound by, by such a positive obligation. But the dissolution of the uh, Seattle, the organization, means that the parties are no longer um, willing to uh, take that positive obligation to help each other in, in the event of an arm attack, an arm attack which is premised on a communist attack. So um, that's the position of the department. Mr. And Mr. Because... Chairman, Mr. Chairman, uh, with due respect, ang binabanggit mo lagi pa ulit-ulit ay yung Seattle. We agree na yung Seattle na abolish na. But the Southeast Asia Defense, Collective Defense Treaty, yung sinasabi ko, with all due respect, eh, hindi pa na-abolish. Kasi ang ina dalawa nga ang treaty, yung treaty, yung mother treaty, the Southeast Asia De Collective Defense Treaty, na nanganak ng Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, na na-dissolve noong 1977. We agree with that, the solution of Seattle. But the mother treaty, is still in existence. Hindi, the, uh, you, you mentioned aggression. Uh, aggression can be psychological. Alam niyo naman natin, si na Joe Masiso, nasa ibang bansa yun eh. Wala naman dito. So yung, 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 dome, yung domestic threat natin, naniniwala siguro ang, ang PNP, AFP, na hindi lang galing dito, may support yan galing sa labas. May support yan kung saan man. So uh, I... I I disagree with the uh, interpretation of the DFA na wala na tayong communist threat, walang tulong nang gagaling sa ibang bansa, eh kaya nga naka, nahihirapan na rin itong AFP at PNP kasi may tulong sa ibang bansa. Nakikinig ang, ang, ang AFP. I hope General Felipe is still around. Uh, nakikinig kayo. Uh, para sa kaalaman ni uh, Atty. Bata, modesty aside, and General Warren De Leon, my classmate can attest to this. Hindi po sa pag, uh, yaya bang, graduate din po ako ng Command and General Staff College. Alam niyo ba, pag nag ka sa General Staff College, meron kang mga mga foreign uh, classmates. At nagtataka po ako nun, bakit may mga kaklase ako tiga Pakistan, may kaklase ako mga tiga Australia, may kaklase ako tiga New Zealand. Kasi ito po yung dating, ito yung membro ng Southeast Asian uh, collective Defense Treaty Agreement. Hanggang ngayon po, isa sa mga core subjects na sa dinanganan ko ay tungkol sa communism, anti-communism, anti-insurgency. So ito pa rin yung template nung, nung pinag-aaralan ngayon. Kaya hindi pwedeng sabihin na tapos na itong issue ito. We're still confronted with anti-insurgency. We're still confronted in the, in the hinterlands, in the countryside, with communist threats. So, uh, uh, ulitin ko ha, DFA, uh, with all due respect, Mr. Chairman, can you submit a valid uh, paper which would show that the Southeast Asia Collective Defense Treaty has been abrogated, denounced, terminated in accordance with the treaty itself, which shows that it should be uh, uh, remain in force indefinitely according to Article 10 or from the provisions of the Vienna Convention and the Law of Treaties apart from what you're saying that the Rebus Six Tantibus Doctrine should be applied should be applied, I agree, but that's with Seattle, but with this particular agreement, para, para naman maintindihan ng mga kasamahan natin sa Sandatahan Lakas at sa Philippine National Police na nawala na itong treating ito not just because of the interpretation of the Department of Foreign Affairs, but with the agreement of all the parties that, that there is no more communist threat, we have dissolved the Southeast Asia Defense Treaty Agreement. Can you give us a document uh, to guide the committee likewise and to guide, to guide the Senate uh, accordingly? Attorney Bata. Uh, 
Uh, yes, Your Honor, we will do that. We will take a look at the um, extant records and um, see how we can um, view this, you know, from your perspective. But also, um, if I may, no, no, Mr. no, 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 not just my perspective. Uh, I I view this from the lens of international law. Nagaral din po ng international law atong libata. So it is not my personal opinion. Uh, my basis is uh, jurisprudence of international law, among others. So. Show me a document that this has been terminated. And why is it that even the website of the United States State Department shows that this treaty is still valid and enforced? And the oh, same is yeah. true with the United Kingdom, Australia, and New Zealand. So show me something uh, which would prove na wala na talaga to. Kaya ako sinasabi to para gumaan naman yung trabaho ng ng ating sandatahan lakas, ng ating kapulisan, na meron pa pala tayong isang uh, tratado na pwedeng sandalan, na pwedeng gamitin. Uh, okay, uh, Your Honor, if I may? Yes, go ahead. Um, we will uh, take note of uh, that uh, that request. Um, also, if I may, I, I would also like to point out... Um, Pero, Pero in... Dr. Batak, don't lecture me on international law. Matagal na <laughs> no, akong tumaan dyan. Matagal na akong tumaan dyan. Uh, I've been through great professors of international law. So don't lecture me on international law. Go ahead, uh, go ahead. Yes. Um, Your Honor, um, the department would also like to point out that beyond the legal issues of whether or not this treaty is still in effect, uh, we would also would like to manifest that uh, a, a, a treaty has a political and a legal aspect. And so um, it must be recalled that the commitment of the parties to the Manila Pact um, has been considered as fundamentally weak even during the heyday of Seattle. And as such, it is all the more logical to assume that the Philippines could not expect any support from them, especially now that the treaty is considered to have been defunct for decades. Um, also, we would also like to point out that even if we were Chato, to assume... That's Seattle. Seattle. Uh, yeah, that's Seattle. That is, yeah. yes. you, you don't... You don't uh... You're confusing. Uh, you're you're mixing Seattle with the Southeast Asia Defense Treaty. Na Seattle na wala kasi yung France hindi nag-support, yung Pakistan umalis kasi nagkaroon ng ng uh, Bangladesh. So iba 'yon. So we go back to the main treaty kasi ito yung mother treaty. So justify now why the treaty as per DFA has been abrogated. And I will ask that during your budget hearings. In the same manner as I asked for your justification why why the Asia Pacific Fisheries Commission uh, from the point of view of DFA was already abrogated, valid pa pala ito. So again, you can proceed. Uh, yes, Your Honor, we will submit the position paper and um, we will look further into the Asia Pacific Fisheries Agreement as well. We will include that in the position paper. Chairman. Yes, yes, sir. Apparently, we, we are at odds with some uh, uh, interpretative issues here. Uh, they're saying that it is now uh, invalid or terminated, while the other countries, uh, supposed to be state signatories, are considering this as valid. So how do we, how do we end this, uh, Mr. Chairman, when our own Department of Foreign Affairs they're considering this as no longer in existence. Mr. Chair, if I may. Dalawa kasi yun, Mr. Chairman, pinagsasama nila eh. Yung Southeast Asia Defense Treaty Agreement, which is the mother treaty, gave birth to the Seattle. The Seattle was abolished in 1977. Ang interpretation nila, since the, mother, the, the, the child treaty was abolished, abrogated, the mother treaty will likewise be, will, will likewise be uh, terminated, which is, not, which is not the case. It, it would have been better had it been the reverse. Abolish the mother treaty, the child treaty is uh, likewise deemed terminated. So I, I, I would suggest, Mr. Chairman, that uh, the, the Department of Foreign Affairs take a look into this and submit a very comprehensive uh, paper uh, taking into consideration why the other treaty state parties are considering this treaty are still valid, even the United States. And uh, again, stop lecturing us 
on uh, provisions on the Vienna Convention and the Law of Treaties. Just give your salient uh, interpretation backed by jurisprudence and signatures of the parties that we have terminated this treaty. Pero sa ngayon, wala kayong maipakita na tapos na pala itong tri tratadong ito. E pa, paano nyo papatunayan na wala na itong treaty? Baka tinatamad lang yung DFA mag-aral dito. Katulad po nung nangyari dun sa Asia Pacific Fisheries Commission na sinabi ko two years ago, nangako kayo magbigay ng position paper, eh hanggang ngayon, hindi pa kayo nakakapag-submit. Nag-COVID-19 uh, nag, ano na, nag, uh, nag na. Apparently, ang, ang dahilan lang pala dito ay hindi tayo nagbabayad ng dues doon sa Asia Pacific Con uh, Fisheries Commission based in Bangkok na makakatulong sana sa ating mga mangingisda, uh, Mr. Chairman. So, paano po natin tatapusin ito, Mr. Chairman? I, I, I have taken uh, much of your time. Again, and, lang. Uh, yeah. Ah, tika, Senator Marcos, uh, let's listen to her inputs first. Senator Marcos. Well, I think uh, we understand the purpose of Senator Talentino in trying to look this up. Perhaps the question moving forward is to inquire what's its equivalent in the ASEAN uh, construct? Do we have a similar collective defense treaty given that this is very much the post-Cold War scenario? Or, um, as others have said, the second Cold War scenario. Tignan natin. Meron bang equivalent to para magamit din natin? I think uh, tama yung kay Senator Tolentino. Kailangan maghagilap ng mga kakampe sa barangay ASEAN. Kumbaga. Um, yeah, Mr. Chair, Chair, if I may. Yung, yung, yung pronunciation ko, Siato, kasi ginaya ko po kay Presidente Marcos to, Siato na Siato. <laughs> Siato. Pero oh. Carlos P. Romulo, pero ang binabanggit na iba, Sito. Sito. Siato yun, Siato yun sa Pinoy. Siato yung binabanggit na iba. Uh, correct. You. Hindi rin asin. Asin yan talaga. <laughs> Attorney Batak, please uh, uh, respond. Yes, Mr. Chair. Within the ASEAN, we have a... Um, nuclear treaty. Um, so that means that um, no nuclear weapons are supposed to be um, um, established or installed anywhere near the treaty area. And then in, in that treaty, we also, we are requesting um, nuclear states such as China, US, UK, oh, France. Pero anti-nuclear lang yun? Wala bang uh, declaration of collective defense din? Um, are, what are the opportunities for uh, collective defense pa? Because clearly, uh, post- Seattle, uh, talaga namang uh, wala nang uh, wala nang pinag-uusapan na collective defense. Pero sa panahon nito, siguro maganda rin i-explore. Ano pa yung posibilidad kung sinasabi ninyo hindi na pwede itong Seattle? Uh, we will, Your Honor, if I may, um, we will look into that. But for the ASEAN um, as, a, as, a, as a political and regional bloc, if they have an existing uh, defense um, alliance with third states outside of ASEAN. Um, I have yet to encounter... Within ASEAN lang. Within ASEAN lang. Wala na yung plus one, plus two, plus three. ASEAN lang. Within ASEAN lang. What are the uh, bases for a collective defense pact? If any. We will have to check with our ASEAN office, uh, Your Honor, and we will get back to you with an exhaustive list. Kasi anti-nuclear lang naman yung uh, sinasabi ninyo eh. Oo, iba naman yun. Thank Mr. You. Chair, Mr. Chair, may I have the privilege? Yes, Attorney. No. Uh, Attorney Dan. Uh, the assessment of the Department of National Defense about uh, the Southeast Asia Collective Defense Treaty and SIATO. Ano bang purpose ng Collective Defense Treaty and what is also the purpose of SIATO? When we go over, it's all the same. Pariyo lang eh. Uh, the creation of the Seattle actually, of course, from coming from the collective defense. Tama yung, tama yung distinction ni Senator Tolentino. And I appreciate with that. Ano? Uh, the Seattle aimed to prevent uh, the prevalence of communism in the region, as well as strengthen economic and social cooperation. The, the Seattle, Mr. Chair, had only few formal functions, including the hosting of joint military ex exercises. Unlike the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the Seattle, or even that collective uh, uh, collective defense association of, uh, uh, of these countries, they have no permanent military command structure. 
which lead to the failure of collective action among its member states, specifically during the Vietnam War. Furthermore, the organization failed to provide assistance to Pakistan during the Indo-Pakistani War in 1965. Due to collective action of the same members, collective treaty or uh, shato, due to collective uh, action problem of vario and various failures of the shato, the member state states started to withdraw from the organization in the early 1970s, which led to its formal dissolution of on 30 June 1977. So parang, gano, parang pareho na rin eh. Although tama ang distinction na ibinigay ni si Tortolentino. The Department of National Defense is of the view that the implementation of the Manila Pact is no longer applicable or even feasible, particularly in the Philippines' position in the West Philippine Sea. Considering that the Seattle, which is also a collective defense treaty, was unable to fully operationalize and that not all Southeast Asian countries, particularly climate states, were not states parties to the treaty. Moreover, the creation of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations had overtaken this collective treaty, including, uh, has already put, the, the ASEAN, uh, Mr. Chair, has already provided a critical platform for various areas of cooperation, including defense and security. Through the ASEAN Defense Minister's Meeting, or ADMM, which serves as the highest defense, consultative, and cooperative mechanism in the ASEAN, the ASEAN member states continuously strengthen practical cooperation in the field of defense and security, as well as address specific issues and challenges with dialogue partners through ADMM+. Ano ito mga plus? Like Australia, US, China, or even Russia, etc. So ito na ngayon ang nag-address itong situation sa, uh, as far as uh, discussion on defense and security. The ASEAN Defense Minister's Meeting, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, alam ko... Asento, uh, yes. Asento, Tolentino. Opo. Oh, yung pong sa... I agree with what the gentleman from Defense Studies had mentioned, but to be, to be specific, there is an Article 3 of the Southeast Asian Collective Defense Treaty which aims to strengthen even uh, economic cooperation, technical, etc., etc. I, I know this has been subsumed by the ASIN, as mentioned by Senator Marcos, but remember, there, there were products, uh, there were executions relative to Article 3. They were able to establish even a cholera laboratory in Dhaka and even in Pakistan because of this treaty. The reason why I'm saying this is that perhaps this is a window of opportunity to, to look into this pandemic, etc., etc. But this is not just uh, for defense. Even, even, the, even the matter of health concerns, economic concerns were addressed by this. Me product ito. So I'm not, I'm not agreeing with the DFA na tapos na ito. Yung laboratory ng cholera na ginawa nito is still functioning and producing by vaccines uh, for, for the member states. So you should, you should uh, give us a definitive uh, answer. How was this terminated? According to your interpretation, Attorney Batak, and if you can give that, give that uh, during, during the next hearing, probably I, I will agree or uh, I will be con convinced me uh, that this has been dissolved. By dissolving the child or, uh, treaty, you dissolve the mother treaty. Convince us. And convince me again that there is no more communist threat. Hindi na maniniwala itong sandatahan lakas natin na wala nang anti-insurgency problem ang ating bansa. Convince us. And prove that. At otherwise, hindi na natin kailangan itong uh, ECLAC, ELCAC, uh, because you have, you have uh, DFA uh, by virtue of your statement, you have uh, ended uh, the insurgency problem in our country, uh, which is the longest in, uh, insurgency problem in Southeast Asia, if not in the world. So, Mr. Chair, mahahaba na po ito. 
So siguro po sa, sa next hearing, if they can produce that uh, definitive, uh, conclusive statement that this has been terminated, backed up by jurisprudence, when we tackle the Mutual Defense Treaty, I, I will be uh, concurring with them if they can prove that. Otherwise, uh, it is now, if they cannot prove that, it is now the function of the Department of Foreign Affairs being the depository of all the signatures of, uh, of the other states who have yet to withdraw to perhaps invite the attention of Australia, New Zealand, the United States, United Kingdom as the, the Secretariat that the Manila PAC still survives. That's one of the jobs of the uh, of the uh, secretariat pursuant to the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaty because non-use, disuse, is not really a uh, valid ground for terminating this treaty because it is not contained in the articles of the treaty, and as the as Article 10 states, this treaty shall remain in force indefinitely. Attorney Batak. So we await that. Yun na lang po, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Lugi po ako sa inyo kasi nandito pa ako sa Senado. Mag-uwi mag na yung mga stock dito. Baka, baka patayan na po ako ng ilaw dito, Mr. Chairman. Sige po. And uh, we uh, unexpectedly, we also took uh, longer to discuss the ATT kasi. So anyway, Attorney Batak, uh, thank you for representing the DFA. Fact-finding ito eh, itong resolution ni Santo Tolentino asking the committee to ask DFA what's the status of the, you know, and uh, the answer we get is uh, terminated no? from your point of view, but Santo Tolentino uh, is asking for a uh, position paper on how you arrived at such a conclusion. Yun na lang. Pero uh, just one or two factual questions. Depository is Manila. What does that mean, Attorney Batak? We are the Secretariat of the Treaty, parang ganon? Uh, the, you, uh, Mr. Chair, the treaty provides that notices of denunciation um, and accession to the treaty are supposed to be deposited with the government of the Republic of the Philippines. So DFA designated the Secretariat for that or a group, a, a, a committee for that? Siyempre tutok, um, di ba? May committee nakatutok para dyan, tama? That would be the Office of Treaties and Legal Affairs, sir, and assisted by the relevant geographic office. So if Australia, for example, sends a notice of denunciation, that would mm -hmm. go to our ASPAC, Asia-Pacific office, and then forward it to the Treaties and Legal Affairs office. Okay, so, and you're representing that office, the Treaties and Legal, legal Affairs. So alam, 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 mo kung, alam, mo kung, alam mo kung active pa ba yung person, personnel na designated ninyo to 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 act as the secretary active pa ba yung folder na yan wala nang galawan now when we check sir uh, mr chair we there are no notices of denunciations on record no ah denunciations on record tapos uh, may may headquarters di ba yung organization in bangkok uh, what do you know about the headquarters functioning or closed or abandoned ano na uh, Mr. Chair, the only thing we know is that the organization has been dissolved. And, That's the Seattle, and so, Mr. Chairman, again. Yato, 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 okay. Mr. So, Chairman, yato, Mr. Chairman, what was dissolved with an organization in Bangkok is Seattle. Seattle, okay. Not, so, not this uh, treaty, which is based in Manila. Seattle so the, formed 1955. This one, uh, this treaty I'm referring to, was established 1954. Okay. So it was the, the Seattle had HQ in Bangkok. Eh, since wala na rin yung Seattle, so we don't expect to find that HQ anymore. Okay. So the question is the treaty. Uh, yes, uh, Senator Marcos? Wala eh, kasi period ng 65-66, uh, kwento na lang ng Lola Basha, no? I don't know what the legal import is, and this is certainly not tantamount to a denunciation of a treaty. But nevertheless, it was very clear cut uh, to my father at that time that Seattle was an American initiative which he was not prepared to go with. So the determination with then uh, Singapore Premier Lee Kuan Yew was to set up a, uh, an Asian-initiated group. And the full configuration became ASEAN. 
because several of the members, including the Philippines, were not willing to send an armed contingent to South Vietnam. It was all about the Vietnam War. So nabaklas yung Seattle na yan dahil nga kasi it looked like a colonial organization and they wanted to have a neutral organization because at the end of the day, as most of the ASEAN members said, Vietnam will always be our, mem our neighbor. So we cannot wreak war and have walk against our neighbor. We will live next to them forever. So naging ASEAN yun. And uh, the determination was that it was going to be uh, predetermined. It was not going to be initiated by any colonial power. And it wasn't going to be obliged in any way to send armed troops to a close neighbor. Yun ang initiative nun eh. Kaya nabuwag yung siyato. Yun ang alam ko. Thank you. Kwento Thank lang. you. Thank you. So, ganun na lang, Attorney Batak. The requests from uh, Senator Tolentino uh, stand, no? So, please submit in writing na lang to the committee. We will do, but, Mr. Chair. But we know, but but presently, uh, presently, the stand of the DFA is this from your point of view, the treaty, the treaty uh, is no longer in effect. Yes, Your Honor. Right now. The okay, right paper now. be signed by the Secretary of Foreign Affairs, not just by the legal department, the position paper emanating from uh, the DFA. Attorney Batak, is that possible? We will do it, uh, Mr. Chair. Very good. Okay. Okay, so we suspend the consideration of Senate Resolution 786. Senator Tolentino, no objection? Okay. Okay, with that, with that, I move that we defer sa the consideration of Senate Resolution 787 kasi usapan pa rin po yun, ano? And maybe uh, this early, pero at least sasabihan na natin ng DND, DFA, about the subject matter. This early, you tell this committee if uh, you feel uh, anong tawag ba doon? Uh, comfortable in discussing this in public, uh, live stream to the public, or you, if you want uh, an executive session in the future this early, decision na nyo na po and uh, tell tell this committee so, so we can adjust. Mr. Chair? So with that, uh, yes, who is... Uh, sir, sorry, sir, if I may, um, we would also prefer to have an executive session that's not available yes, to the public. Uh, sabi ko na nga, sabi ko na nga, yan ang pakiramdam ko nga. Okay, so, yes. So, in the meantime, since we have the suspended uh, agenda number two, and uh, we will uh, defer agenda number three, so we will now uh, suspend our hearing. My colleagues, if, they have no, if there is no objection, okay. So sure, with thanks uh, to all of the resource persons who participated, thank you to the staff also for rendering overtimes, and thank you for my uh, colleagues for uh, attending and uh, participating. So yeah. the chair hereby suspends uh, our hearing. Dagang salamat sa tanan. Dagang salamat Thank you very much. Happy weekend. So